with um, the first session of the second course of the conference. Um, this course is given by Vimir Anashin from uh, the Lomonosov University in Moscow. And uh, his topic is uh, the periodic automata theory and applications. Uh, please, Professor Vladimir, when, when you are ready. Okay. Uh, do you hear me well? Yeah. Now we can hear you. Now we can hear you. Uh, okay, you can hear me well. Okay, that's good. Do you hear? Do you hear my uh, uh, presentation? Right. The title. Yes. That. Okay. Then this is uh, this is uh, additional material if needed. Um, this is a blackboard. Also, if needed. Do you see the text on the blackboard? Yes. 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 Okay. So I am ready. Then. Uh, okay, so I am go where I go here. Well, uh, first of all, uh, um, I am happy to see uh, so many uh, young people which are uh, interested in uh, the periodic theory. And I am going to give you a short lecture course on the periodic automata theory and its applications. Actually, uh, the periodic theory, uh, well, and the periodic automata theory is uh, popular in our, uh, at our faculty uh, because it uh, has, uh, well, uh, well, uh, immediate applications to computer science and some other, uh, some other things. Uh, and yeah. actually, this is uh, this course is uh, uh, a, a mandatory, uh, a mandatory course for master students who are, uh, specialize, for example, in information security and uh, uh, and uh, other uh, applied um, uh, well, uh, disciplines of computer science. So I uh, start with. Um, uh, uh, outline of the course. So I first of all, uh, I want to show that uh, the periodic one Lipschitz maps are exactly the automata maps, if uh, from the computers, uh, from the view of computer scientist view, and uh, 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 there are, if uh, speaking uh, from the physical uh, side, that there are causal functions. Uh, then we will speak about um, explicit representations of periodic one Lipschitz functions. Then I, uh, the short outline, maybe not very short outline of the ergodic theory of periodic one Lipschitz functions. And then we'll speak about, uh, well, more exotic thing, but maybe not very exotic, we'll plot so automata maps in, in Euclidean spaces. And uh, the uh, second part of the course is applications. So the first application is to computer science and the second application is to physics. Well, the, uh, the book which I use is, my monograph together with Andrei Hrenik, which, uh, well, uh, 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 well, this is, uh, this, uh, this is that book. And uh, also, uh, I have a textbook because uh, for uh, our students at the Moscow State University, the, the, the course is uh, given in, in English, by the way, in, in Moscow State University. And the, the text of the textbook, which uh, this one, uh, well, uh, is, uh, you can find it here. Uh, this was the first draft with some mistakes, etc. And uh, these are expository papers, uh, which uh, which uh, which uh, uh, well also deals with the subject of my uh, today's lecture. And uh, now I'm I'm start with the periodic one Lipschitz maps, uh, and I will start with the uh, well um, the definition, formal definition, uh, which I will uh, then restate in less formal ways. And this is the definition of a system. Well, this is a general definition of a system. So it's a, a five tuple uh, consisting of uh, uh, non-empty finite set, the input alphabet. Uh, well, uh, th then is uh, the output alphabet uh, and uh, uh, non-empty, possibly infinite state of epistemic states, let's say so, and the state transition function, 
the state transition function and an output function. Uh, well, uh, uh, this is a miscalled autonomous if uh, this uh, uh, state transition function and output function uh, does not depend on input. Uh, and uh, in other case, the system is called non-autonomous. Physicists will rather say that it is a, a system which is uh, um, closed, not closed. Well, uh, uh, and uh, initial automaton, or also in automata theory, which also known under the name letter to letter transducer, is a system with which uh, one of the states is fixed, it is called the initial state. A physicist would say that it is uh, the state where, where the system is prepared initially. Well, that's formal. A computer scientist will, will think of, uh, of an automaton uh, of, uh, like this. Uh, so uh, 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 there is uh, well a registry which keeps a state, what, whatever could it be, let it be a number. Uh, then uh, the input string, uh, you can think of this as zeros and ones or letters of certain other alphabet or blocks, etc. And uh, this is a function, the state transition function or state update function. It's constantly update at every step. It constantly update the, uh, the state of the registry and uh, the output function at every step also produces the output, the letter of output, the letter of output, which, which depends on input letter, on input letter and on the current state of the, of the registry. This is, uh, this is uh, sort of say schematic representation. Well, um, um, more uh, well, uh, maybe suitable for people who are working in um, uh, periodic in periodic theory is representation via the tree. Uh, this is a periodic tree. This is a periodic tree. This is an initial state. You you know that uh, the periodic numbers, uh, in particular, two periodic numbers, can be associated to an infinite tree. Uh, which uh, uh, where uh, every each node has exactly two branches, but here the branches are labeled with uh, <clears throat> two numbers, uh, which is input symbol, and that one is output symbol. What how how we can read this? Uh, read this um, um, uh, well. Uh, 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 if if uh, the automaton is in initial state as zero, and if it uh, uh, accepts one, then it produces uh, then it produces uh, zero and goes to the state as one. If if the automaton uh, accepts, it produces one on the output and goes to the state as two, etc., etc. But actually, uh, this is an example state transition diagram. And our Moore diagram, and um, uh, <clears throat> of course we can. Uh, 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 this diagram can be reduced. Uh, we will call the two states of the automaton equivalent. If we take them as initial states, the word mappings performed by either of the automaton are equal one to another. So. Uh, uh, if input words are equal one to another, then corresponding output words are also equal one to another. Uh, and then the tree-like state transition diagram can be reduced by that equivalence uh, relations, thus resulting in a reduced diagram. For example, this was this was a diagram uh, which correspond to the mapping, uh, the, which is called an odometer ma mapping x to x plus one uh, addition of one of two eddic integers, and uh, this is uh, this is how the reduced state, state transition diagram is is uh, uh, is look uh, uh, is looking like so this is initial state and uh, you can try yourself uh, for example to send a base uh, two representation of a number uh, any number you like uh, do all these uh, uh, calculations with the using of uh, this uh, state transition diagram. And you will see that this really adds uh, the output will really the uh, base two representation of that number plus one. So we, 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 we are just adding one to the base two represent uh, to the number represented by its two base two representation. But, but, Okay, <clears throat> this is a reduced state transition diagram of autonomous uh, automaton. Automaton here. This is a constant. Uh, uh, actually, this is a constant. Also, you can you can try this uh, also yourself. 
uh, uh, this uh, this is an initial state, and this automaton uh, will produce uh, the sequence one uh, zero or uh, one zero one zero yeah yeah uh, uh, etc. Independently uh, of, of what of what input because it, it does not depend on input. Also, it's, it always produces one uh, at the first stage, uh, zero of the second stage, etc. Uh, so this will be the sequence one zero one zero etc. And uh, 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 you can uh, readily understood that it, it is minus one third in a theoretic representation. Uh, uh, well, uh, well. Uh, um, um, so given two automata which perform the same mapping, uh, uh, the, uh, then the reduced uh, state transition diagram of both coincide, so they are completely determined by the state transition diagram. And uh, another important notion is a finite, uh, finite automaton. Finite automaton means that it can be represented by a finite uh, uh, state transition diagram. So the, the reduced uh, uh, diagram will be uh, uh, Will consist um, <clears throat> will have only finite uh, number of nodes, and it is an important um, uh, important notion because it means that the automaton, um, uh, uh, so to say, has a finite memory. Finite memory. Not every automaton, uh, not every calculation can be uh, produced in an automaton which has a finite memory. But uh, uh, the ones uh, the ones which uh, have a finite memory, so finite number of states, they uh, well uh, they are important in in our future uh, uh, well um, uh, well consideration. So how it works? <coughs> it works well uh, in quite obvious ways. So you can uh, think of an automaton as a box. Well, uh, 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 which in that box uh, can be in some number of states. Uh, we, not, we, we, we have no idea what are the states. We cannot uh, observe them. What we can observe is input and output. So if we input the first symbol to the automaton, we obtain the output uh, symbol, which depends on the input symbol, uh, uh, this and then uh, uh, of that output symbol. Okay, then, uh, but the automaton, well, we input symbol uh, um, chi zero, it uh, will switch to the to the states S S one S one because uh, which depends on the chi zero and the previous state, and the next stage um, we obtain uh, the next uh, the next symbol, uh, uh, and the automaton changes its state, updates its state to the next state, etc. etc. And uh, this way, we may uh, we obtain the mapping on uh, infinite uh, words, infinite strings uh, over the input alphabets, alphabet to infinite strings over output alphabet. And uh, uh, this is uh, this is called an automaton function. What is important, the most important, I'd rather say, about that automaton function, about that automaton function, the output symbol. The output symbol depends only the symbol which have already been inputted. Uh, the output symbol, uh, uh, this output symbol cannot uh, cannot depend on the symbol chi i plus one, for example, chi i plus two, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it depends only on the past and present. It does not depend on the future. It does not depend on the future. So this is. This is why this is why this is a formal representation of a causality law, and uh, the automaton function is completely determined by this by this uh, sequence of maps by this sequence of maps by this sequence of maps. We may not uh, we may know nothing about uh, these uh, uh, these uh, uh, um, epistemic states of the automaton, but if we have this sequence of maps, of maps, we can uh, uh, we, we, we can uh, well uh, produce these. Uh, we, we can perform these mappings, and vice versa. If if we have we know uh, all these functions, state update and output function, we can we can well at least in principle we can calculate. Uh, uh, of course, it can be an infeasible task, but nonetheless, uh, such functions, such such functions, phi exists. This is, this is what, uh, what are automata maps. 
So the automaton maps infinite words left infinite sequences uh, to left infinite sequences of the corresponding alphabets. And we will, uh, well, from this moment, we will usually take these um, alphabets, um, input and the output alphabets as a consisting of a uh, prime number uh, P symbols, symbols. So, uh, and uh, we can now associate infinite words to canonical representations of periodic integers. So you, you already know what is a periodic integer. So this is a canonical form. This is a canonical form of the periodic integer. And uh, this is a one-to-one -one correspondence in the, uh, with this left, say, left infinite string. You may think of left uh, infinite strings as of base P uh, representations of numbers. Uh, but uh, which uh, have, uh, th they may have uh, uh, um, well, an infinite number of uh, well, significant digits. So infinite, infinite sequences, uh, these are infinite sequences. What are the most important in the future considerations? The map, this map is our automaton function. Well, up to this, up to this identification, up, up to this, a uh, one-to-one -one correspondence, if and don't leave, this map is one Lipschitz map with respect to periodic metric. Now, this, is this clear or not? Or, or it's need explanations. Of course, in one uh, 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 that, uh, uh, at, least, uh, at least I think that uh, it, uh, it is clear that that map, which performs mapping like this is one Lipschitz. Because the converse statement is not easy, and they, uh, is not easy at all. But uh, uh, well, uh, okay, okay. If 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 some comments, uh, extra comments are needed, well, imagine that, the, that we have a box and we have uh, an, an input symbol chi zero, chi one, uh, chi. Excuse me, Vladimir. There is a question in the room. Uh, there is a question. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, here. Yes. yes. Can you recall me the automaton function definition? The automaton function definition is uh, uh, mm, uh, 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 well uh, exactly exactly this one. Yeah. The automaton function. It's the map. The map, which uh, is produced. Uh, 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 produced by the automaton, by the automaton, uh, uh, it acts on mm, uh, uh, input words and produces output words. So the the uh, domain are all infinite words over input alphabet, and range are all infinite words over output alphabet, and produces like this, like this. You send input, you send input. Uh, to the automaton symbol by symbol. Each symbol changes the internal state and uh, the, uh, the change of internal state depends on, on input symbol and on previous state. And the output symbol depends on input symbol and the current state. Is this clear? Okay, perfect. So do you need the condition of leap switch to make sure that the uh, result in the codomain is an element in ZP, or what is the reason that you put that on this? Yes, yes. The, this is this is what I said. If you have, uh, you can you can uh, 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 um, uh, you can define uh, well a, a metric on the this is a standard metric on uh, um, uh, infinite uh, words, uh, and uh, according to this metric, the uh, mapping is automaton if and only if it is one Lipschitz. This is the theory. This means that if if uh, uh, you have an one Lipschitz map, you can write uh, down some something like this diagram, or you can represent it like that. This is if and only if condition. I, I think that it's because. It only depends on the previous ones, X1, X1. This is only because of this. 
only because of this, because output symbol depends only on symbols which have already been inputted. It does not depend on the future symbols. It's only, it's, it's only because of this. I, I think that it's clear. So can, can, can I proceed with this? Yes, thanks. Uh, okay. Uh, it's quite a, uh, uh, the converse statement is not easy. So uh, questions, no? The converse statement is not easy, but it is known um, uh, at least since 60s. Uh, and uh, the, the, the proof you can find in, uh, in the book of uh, Arto Salama, theory of automata, but uh, uh, well, uh, since that, uh, um, uh, a long time passed, uh, and people does not try to use periodic, um, um, uh, didn't uh, didn't try to use periodic analysis to study uh, to study uh, uh, well uh, automata functions just because uh, the classical theory of automata is is so to say about these these things how to represent it by state transition diagram, what is this graph looking like, etc., etc. This is classical theory, uh, automata theory. But currently we will deal uh, not, with, uh, 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 not with automata, so to say, internal structure of automata uh, uh, itself, but with automata functions by themselves. Why? Because in, in applications, and uh, we can say a lot about Automata just just studying the uh, 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 the, uh, the mapping they produce, and this is uh, the, uh, this is uh, automata functions. This is just uh, one Lipschitz functions. Sometimes it will be convenient to consider automata with multiply inputs over P symbol alphabet and multiply outputs. Uh, uh, then take this alphabet of uh, P to the uh, power n symbols and uh, output alphabet P to the power m symbols. This will be, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, also an automaton, and we, this will be the map, the map of periodic, uh, uh, of the space of, uh, uh, so to say, n-dimensional vectors over periodic integers to n-dimensional vectors over periodic integers, so rather say blocks, uh, which is also satisfy uh, a Lipschitz condition. So this is also uh, if and only if condition, if and only if condition. Uh, so, uh, what, I, what I stress if speaking about uh, possible physical application and applications to physics, the observer, external observer can only make guesses about internal structure of the system, uh, but what he can observe, it's only, he, go, he can only compare input to output, and that's all, he only make uh, experiments, only make experiments. Okay, so a uh, one Lipschitz map is called a finite automaton function. If there exists automaton, uh, which, which uh, is a finite uh, set of states uh, 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 and which has this, uh, this function. So if this function can be produced by automaton having a finite memory. And there are examples. Uh, um, uh, well, of course, uh, you may say that uh, well, the real world systems uh, cannot have infinite number of uh, states, uh, but uh, well, uh, the, the number of states can be huge. And um, uh, so we need to st also study and uh, automata with uh, infinite number of states. And moreover, standard uh, uh, operations, the standard um, arithmetical instructions, for example, addition, and multiplication. These both are automatic functions. These both are automatic functions, but addition is a finite automaton function and multiplication is not. For example, you cannot uh, do, uh, you cannot rise a natural number to a square uh, using an automaton with finite memory. Squaring is not po po possible on automata with uh, a finite number of, of states. The, but of course, we do squaring. That's why we uh, that's why we um, uh, we uh, uh, deal with automata which have both finite and uh, infinite uh, number of states. So finite and infinite automata functions. Uh, well, uh, 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 this is uh, a constant map, a constant map is a finite automaton function if and only if, a constant map produces a constant, right? If and only if it is a constant, a constant 
which is from here, which uh, is uh, piedic, uh, rational piedic integers. It, it, it is clear because, because if, you have, if you have an automaton which has a finite number of states, then uh, sooner or later, he, he, he will produce a cycle. And, and uh, numbers, periodic numbers, uh, whose uh, base P, uh, um, uh, canonical periodic form is um, uh, um, uh, periodic, uh, ultimately periodic. Uh, they are exactly the numbers which lies there, here. Is this clear? For example, this is me minus one third. This automaton produces minus one third. But one third, minus, if we take, if we have a base to, um, if we have P equal to two. Is this clear that this is minus one third or not? No? Yes? Okay. I, 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 I will. Yes. 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 Clear. Okay. So then I proceed. Uh, um, this is a state transition diagram of uh, an automaton, which is also P is two, uh, which is multiplication by five. And uh, so it produces a linear map, uh, or uh, more general, uh, more general. Uh, well. Uh, map is uh, uh, one Lipschitz map, uh, sorry, uh, uh, a fine map, uh, um, uh, this uh, map of this sort. It is a finite automaton if and only if both, both coefficients are uh, rational periodic integers, if and only if. So, so they, they uh, uh, representations, uh, they uh, canonical representations as periodic numbers are ultimately periodic. Uh, so um, uh, generally multiplication as a function of two variables is not a finite automaton. The multiplication by a constant from he is a finite automaton function. And uh, uh, this is an odometer which I already mentioned. This is the mapping uh, uh, Z to Z plus one. It is also a finite automaton state transition diagram. And uh, now polynomials, polynomials having, uh, having a periodic integer coefficient. Uh, well, uh, a polynomial is a composition of, uh, uh, of uh, additions and a polynomial function is a composition of additions and multiplications. So a composition of automata functions, so sequential, it's, it's a sequential composition, right? It's also an automaton function. So the, there are automata functions. All, all polynomials are automata functions. But a polynomial map is never a finite automaton function if degree of the polynomial greater than two. If degree of the polynomial greater than two. Uh, so, but what is interesting about that function? Uh, uh, this is the theme which I will um, uh, speak of at the end of, of the uh, uh, final uh, lecture uh, in my talk. These functions are well defined. These functions, if you take polynomial, polynomial uh, whose coefficients are rational periodic integers, these functions, polynomial functions, are well defined and they are continuous functions, both on both with respect to real metric. So they are well defined on the uh, on on a real line, and also they are they are well defined on on periodic integers, and they are automata functions. Uh, 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 and there are one Lipschitz functions uh, so also continuous with respect to, to periodic metric. So they are a sort of Janus like kind. They, uh, these, polynomial, uh, po these polynomials, polynomials with rational integer coefficient, they, they uh, so to say, live into worlds simultaneously in Archimedean world and in non Archimedean world. And they are continuous in both worlds with respect to, with respect to, uh, to, the, to, to, to the metric, uh, to, to the corresponding metric. So we will. Um, uh, and the actions, the actions, how they act, these polynomials, this coefficient of, of, of here, they, uh, they, they agree, the actions agree on, 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 the, on the rational periodic integers. And, and this, the, this set is dense, both in uh, the space of periodic integers and both in, in, in real numbers on the real line. And that's why we can we can speak we, we, we can continue to the action on the whole real line or to the whole uh, periodic integers. 
And now annotation. So this, this class of functions, which are, uh, I, I will later, I will define them uh, well, uh, well, uh, rigorously. Uh, uh, the class of function, this genus like uh, functions, we will define like this. Uh, LP will, uh, uh, will be the class of all periodic one Lipschitz functions. So map, mappings from here to here or from ZPN to ZPM in more general form. And we are going to study all this. Uh, uh, all, all these functions. And uh, well, uh, there are more examples. For example, if we have polynomials uh, such that the, uh, and consider the rational, uh, rational functions such that the polynomial is never zero modulo P, and this function is also, is also here. It is, it, it is, can, it can be considered as continuous functions mm -hmm. over R, and it can be, and it is one Lipschitz functions over the P. Or was it be? Well, uh, but uh, there are functions there. Uh, also, I will uh, will speak about this in, in detail later, uh, the, in the final section. Uh, uh, there are functions. It, it possible to show that uh, there are there are functions which uh, in in this class which are not rational, which are not of this form, which are not of this form. They are of uh, some special uh, some special form like this. And uh, uh, these coefficients must be uh, specially, uh, so to say, chosen, uh, such that they, uh, one of conditions, they must go to zero uh, uh, with respect to periodic metric and with respect to real metric, as i goes to infinity. But uh, this is, uh, so to say, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the outline. Uh, uh, and. Uh, one more function uh, type of functions which uh, um, we will be interested in in the class L2 of two edic one Lipschitz function. It is of special interest in computer science because in computer science we deal with sequences of zeros and ones and <coughs> functions of that class are known in computer science and, and in uh, um, uh, cryptography uh, 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 under the name of T functions of t, t, t from triangular. Uh, well, uh, why? Uh, because actually uh, the standard computer instructions plus and uh, multiplication as uh, numbers and bitwise logical operations, uh, bitwise logical instructions like, like exclusive for uh, uh, and or not, they are t functions. Thus their compositions are t functions. But what a composition of logic of, of computer instruction? It is a straight line program. So straight line programs are uh, are uh, uh, t functions. So, so they are one Lipschitz functions uh, with respect to two adic metric. Here are here are examples which are which are used in computer science. So reduction modulo to k. Well, it's 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 uh, we can be can be um, expressed like this z and two k minus one because uh, you know. Uh, the uh, base to this presentation of this is one, 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 and uh, uh, the, the tail of, of all zeros. So the, this will be reduction model to k. Uh, uh, I, I will use this uh, later, this delta as uh, the representation of base to representation of numbers. Uh, this is shift, uh, one bit shift towards higher order bits. This is mask operation end. So this is rising to, to power. But uh, we must take care of the uh, the base must be must be odd, and also then rising to negative powers means it gives fun functions like this. So this fine looking function, a wild composition of arithmetical and bitwise logical operation, is a T function. And just looking at it, 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 it can be by using the uh, periodic theory, the periodic theory, we can say a lot about the behavior of this function, about the behavior of this program. For example, I can immediately say that this function uh, uh, is, um, uh, is uh, bijective modulo two to the power k for every k. So it is a bijective mapping. This automaton uh, maps uh, uh, infinite uh, uh, maps, uh, words of length k uh, to uh, uh, performs a bijective mapping of words of length k or to bit alphabet to works of one length k, k for every k for every k so i, I will not uh, um, uh, take care else uh, should it uh, uh, um, uh, map uh, um, uh, should this mapping is bijective uh, 
uh, of, uh, for example, 256 bit words. It is bijective. It, it can be, and you after after the course, you you will see that why why it is bijective, for example. Well, also, for, well, uh, um, uh, what is what is uh, should be um, uh, should be um, also taken uh, into the account that uh, the uh, the automaton uh, uh, this uh, this is uh, this is quite clear for um, uh, for uh, uh, computer the uh, 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 computer scientist scientists that a uh, uh, really computer lives in a dualic world rather than in uh, in non Archimedean world uh, rather than in in uh, in a, in a world. Uh, of uh, Archimedean word of real numbers. That's why we have so much difficulties with working of, so, so to say, floating point uh, representations. Now uh, we are going to theory. And um, um, uh, first of all, what we are going to do, we will need some, uh, we will need some representation, uh, so to say, in closed form, uh, in, in some standard form. There are a number of standard forms uh, to represent uh, 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 one Lipschitz maps or automatic maps uh, from this moment there are synonymous and one of these formal representation is Mahler expansion or Mahler interpolation series. What are these Mahler interpolation, seri interpolation series? So uh, given a function which is um, uh, with domain uh, whose domain is 0, 1, 2, 3 and uh, 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 the values are here the values are here uh, it can be represented by uh, the only Mahler expansion. Uh, well, it uh, has a unique representation by the so-called Mahler series. It's quite easy to, 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 to prove. Uh, well, uh, well, actually, what I'm speaking about uh, now, uh, well, properties of uh, uh, Mahler series and uh, Van der Poel series later, which I'll speak of, uh, uh, they are here, uh, can be found here in these monographs. And uh, this is binomial coefficient. It defines like this. So this function, this function is well defined for all x, for all x from the p, and it is a continuous function on the p. Uh, it is a continuous function on the p. So it's well, well defined, and everything is okay. Uh, the coefficients of the Mahler expansion can be expressed by the values of the function like this. Uh, and now we are going uh, to, uh, to say a few, a few words more. So this series converges, this series converges uniformly on, uh, on periodic integers. So this is a compact set, you know, uh, so they, then they are uniformly continuous, if and only if the periodic limit, the periodic limit uh, is zero. So if the coefficients tend, tend periodically to zero, this is a known. This is a known theorem. This is a known theorem. Also, for the proof, I'll uh, well, uh, well, uh, well, address to, to Mahler. And the function is uniformly differentiable everywhere on the p, f and only if this holds for all n. And in this case, you can find a derivative. Derivative is like this. Delta is the forward different difference operator. Uh, you know what is forward different operator, right? So this, this is if and only. The function is analytic. Uh, the function is analytic if and only if, uh, well, this, uh, this limit is zero. And uh, well, I, I skip the definition of what is analytic function because it was given at a previous lecture by, uh, by uh, Wilson, for example. <clears throat> and examples of uh, analytic functions. So this, is, this one is analytic on this ball. This function is analytic on this ball for if p is greater than three. And if p is two, this, uh, this function is analytic on that ball. Uh, despite the periodic, periodic uh, earlier number does not exist. But nevertheless, uh, the, the formula is okay. And also uh, this formula, this formula is, is known from many sources. Uh, this is uh, the, um, the uh, power of P, which, uh, uh, which do I, uh, 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 what is the power of P uh, of uh, uh, I factorial? This is exactly this one. What is this? What is this? This one, the weight. This is the weight. This is the sum of base of, of digits in base P uh, uh, 
uh, base P representation of I. Is this clear? Is this formula clear? I will not prove this because it can be followed every day in a, in a, in a, in a number uh, in a number uh, of well, books on number theory. But is this clear how to calculate <laughs> or not? What is weight? It is it clear what is weight or not? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, weight to add equate of three. Three in base two expansion is one zero one. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, wait, let it be five, uh, not three, five, five. So weight is one plus one makes two. This is the weight. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is uh, this is uh, now we can define the different functions, which is uh, an, a, well, a periodic logarithm. Uh, well, also in an analytic function, these are just examples. Uh, this function, this function, uh, is also analytic. How we can see this? We can use we can rise to the power x by formally using uh, the um, uh, uh, Newton binomial formula, but it is okay because this is a Mahler series, right? And uh, if P odd, this, this series converges uniformly. So this is well-defined. This is well-defined function and it is an analytic function on, on the P, right? And uh, this, is, this is the proof, actually. This is a proof, uh, the short proof. The short proof. We just need to calculate to calculate uh, 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 the limit. Uh, the limit. The limit is like this. The limit is like this, right? Right. But uh, uh, this is zero because this function, this function is of slow growth. This function is of slow growth. Uh, it, it, it cannot. It, it, it grows uh, roughly like a logarithm of i of e. So this is this is. Uh, 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 this function is analytic on if p odd and if p two. This function is analytic on on that ball on that ball. So this is, I hope this is clear. Uh, well, uh, uh, more functions, and the first uh, the first theorem which uh, which we uh, we will deal with this uh, uh, which we are dealing with this um, uh, in this direction is the Mahler expansion. How, uh, how we can represent uh, uh, automata functions uh, by using Mahler expansion? The answer is very, very, uh, 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 very easy. Uh, the function, you know, this function, this function represented by Mahler series, and every every continuous function can be represented by Mahler series, if and only if the uh, the uh, periodic norm periodic norm is uh, satisfy these. Uh, this inequality, uh, satisfy this, this inequality. Uh, what is integral part of logarithm? What is the physical meaning, so to say? Uh, 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 the uh, integral part of uh, logarithm is the number of digits of, uh, of the base P expansion of M minus one. This, uh, uh, that's why we assume that uh, uh, integral part of logarithm uh, uh, P of zero is zero because to write a zero, we need uh, still <laughs> one digit, right? Uh, so, uh, is the statement clear? Because I will go uh, uh, now. I will go to the proof. Is the statement clear or not? Can I continue? Yes. So uh, I am going. Uh, I am going to prove this. Okay. Oops, it's not late. Uh, so I will prove this in this the same. Um, so a Mahler expansion for this function. So f is one Lipschitz if and only if every coefficient is zero modulo to, to this power. Well, uh, we, uh, we, you already know what uh, how we, we, we take uh, periodic integers modular, uh, modular p to some power, we just cut off tails, right? And uh, this is the statement. Okay, uh, as uh, the first step, as uh, natural numbers, these natural numbers, 
uh, they constitute an every way dense subset, an every way dense subset, uh, then we can consider uh, this function, uh, this function uh, on, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, on, uh, uh, for example, only on n. Uh, on natural numbers and then expand them if you need it to the whole, to the whole set. But uh, uh, this is this is uh, that is why uh, the function is one Lipschitz if and only if this fraction this fraction is a periodic integer for every n and every x of course. And this is clear because one Lipschitz is, this is clear because because one Lipschitz mean. It means that fx plus n minus fx, uh, uh, it is equal to x plus n minus x it is exactly like this. So this is one Lipschitz, by one Lipschitz. Now we use Gregory Newton formula. This is well-known formula also from the, it read like this. So the, uh, the, 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 well, this is the formal difference, uh, the, the formal difference. So uh, we can express like this. Then we can express, uh, we can do like this. How, how I did like this. I represent uh, n by uh, a binomial coefficient as a product n to by n plus one, by, uh, uh, by n minus one, by n minus two, divided by uh, i factorial. Then I write like this, uh, took uh, from the, um, um, uh, took i here, put i here and uh, put n here. Uh, is this clear? Is this clear how, how, how I get this from this? Or not? Okay. If if not clear, it's uh, a short, uh, well, a, a short. Uh, uh, a short uh, explanation. Um, um, x i is x x minus one uh, x minus i plus one. Uh, one, two, three, i. So I can, I can. Uh, uh, there was n. Okay, uh, 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 okay. I can, I can write like this. Uh, one i here and uh, uh, x here, x minus one, etc. To uh, to i minus one, i minus uh, one factorial here, i minus one factorial here. So now I put it here. Uh, so, n, 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 i. So, this is this, this is clear, right? This, this, this is clear. Uh, this I did here, but and obtain this formula. And uh, well, I continue. Uh, so. We would like to know uh, 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 the condition is that this this must be uh, uh, a periodic integer uh, for all x and all n. Uh, um, but uh, the, this is if and only if when this is a periodic integer for all i and all x. Why? The binomial reciprocity law. For example, if we have a sequence of some numbers related to the other sequence beta of numbers in this form, then you can express this is in this way. This is a, this is a well-known combinatorial formula. Now, now what we can say, uh, we can say that F, F is one Lipschitz, if and only if, if and only if, uh, well, this is one Lipschitz, but this means that this must be, uh, uh, so no, no, uh, 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 these are uh, um, uh, this is uh, periodic integers. If and only if these are all periodic integers, but this is equivalent to this must be all periodic integers. Uh, 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 all these fractions must be periodic integers. Uh, uh, why? Because we uh, we have this representation. We calculate we calculate this because delta delta of of a binomial coefficient is this, and we obtain this series. And uh, this, uh, in this series, in every this series, all coefficient must be periodic integers. Uh, uh, so this must be a periodic integer for all j and for all i less than j. 
but this means that uh, aj is just zero modular p to this power because p to this power is the greatest power of p which uh, divides uh, uh, to which can be uh, uh, to which uh, 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 an integer from one to uh, to j uh, uh, can be divided uh, without uh, a residue this is the proof clear no or questions no, 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 no. Just uh, uh, sorry uh, everything is clear everything clear what? fine 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 uh, for, uh, 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 uh. Van der Poel series <laughs> of the continuous functions. Van der Poel series, uh, uh, these are another sort of series, which also are very useful, which also are very useful to in, uh, to, 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 in the study of one Lipschitz maps. Uh, so if we have a continuous function, PD continuous, uh, there exists a unique sequence of PD integers, so such such that uh, we can represent uh, this continuous function in this form. What are, the, are these guys? Uh, what are these guys? These guys are uh, actually this. Um, uh, this uh, these are defined as as follow. We as follow. Actually, these uh, 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 well, I, I maybe uh, uh, chi is a characteristic function of this ball of uh, radius r r which is equal to this one of these radius center at the time so we we take balls of special of special uh, uh, kinds uh, which are uh, whose centers are natural numbers this m and radius 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 is uh, already uh, like that and uh, and, and uh, these are these are these guys. These are these guys. These are these guys. These are characteristic functions. So we can, these are underput series. Okay. Uh, okay. And uh, this um, um, the theorem can be uh, which looks very similar to that of uh, of that uh, uh, of the um, uh, uh, criteria of one Lipschitzness for. Uh, uh, for periodic, uh, for, in terms of Mahler series, uh, yeah, indeed, uh, 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 this function is one Lipschitz if and only if uh, the coefficients uh, uh, are zero. The, uh, these coefficients, these coefficients, these coefficients must zero modulo p to the power log uh, integral part of uh, integral part of log p m. These are. Uh, uh, this is the statement and the proof um, uh, the proof uh, i will not give the proof uh, because <clears throat> the proof can be uh, can be reduced to the uh, Mahler case uh, uh, because uh, why it can be done so these coefficients these co these coefficients <coughs> can be um, expressed it can be expressed via coefficients of Mahler series of the corresponding function uh, you can come, uh, can find an exact formula in Mahler uh, uh, for instance and uh, uh, by using this by using this uh, 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 well uh, idea you can you can prove uh, this representation but this representation is is useful also why it is useful by using this representation, we can answer the question. We can answer the question when our automaton function, uh, when our automaton function, is finite, uh, is, is is a finite automaton function. Uh, and this is the answer. Given a one Lipschitz function represented by one der Poel series, so in this form, uh, this is a finite automaton function if and only if all coefficients, these coefficients, this one, these coefficients. They constitute a finite subset of rational periodic integers. Of rational periodic integers. So all these these coefficients are rational periodic integers, and in this series they are only finitely many. The series are infinite, but uh, uh, pairwise distinct coefficients are only finitely many. And the second condition, the per kernel of the sequence of this sequence, 
This is sequence of these coefficients is finite. What is pe 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 kernel? The kernel uh, is if we have a sequence of certain numbers. Uh, so it is a set, uh, a p kernel, it is a set of subsequences of this form. So we, we take some, some term in this sequence, number t, for example, and we start jumping uh, 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 in this sequence with jumps of length p to the power k. Uh, 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 p to the cow, uh, p to the cow power k. Uh, no, well, uh, and thus construct an infinite sequence, and thus constructing an infinite sequence. Uh, the set of all such sequences, uh, given this sequence, the set of all such subsequences is called a p kernel. Uh, uh, the second condition is uh, the p kernel must be finite, must be finite. And what is interesting. The, by use, the, there is in, in automata theory, there is an, um, uh, um, well, a very powerful crystal theorem, which, uh, which is about, uh, uh, it answered the question when the p kernel, p kernel is finite. And uh, uh, this is the answer. Uh, there is an injection, an injection of this finite, uh, number of coefficient in a certain field, finite field of p to the power l elements. And such that, that formal power series of this form, of uh, this p element field, are algebraic over a field of formal Laurent series, of formal Laurent series, Laurent series over this field. So this is, this can be, this, uh, this is an answer uh, which, which reduces, which reduces uh, the, finiteness, uh, the, uh, the finiteness of the function to, well, uh, in a sort of to a purely algebraic question, to a purely, uh, to a purely algebraic question. So we can, at least in principle, answer the question, answer the question when an automaton function, when a one Lipschitz function can be produced by by a finite automaton, automaton with a finite number of states. Uh, the proof is based, uh, the proof is uh, not very easy, uh, uh, but it's based on the following observation, which is also important. Uh, so f at x, uh, f, f is a finite automaton function. If and only if, there are only finitely many pairwise distinct functions like this. Of this form. What is written here? Look here. So if we have, uh, speaking loosely, if we have automaton. Professor, excuse me. Yeah. I had a question. Uh, do you recall for us what do you mean by P kernel of a sequence? Sorry? Uh, what is P kernel? P kernel? Number two. This one. This is the definition. Okay. Yeah, thank thank you. you. This is the definition. Okay. So is this clear about the definition? A p kernel is just the set of uh, subsequences derived from the sequence by, by some special rule, I think, of this form. Okay. So uh, can I continue? Okay. Uh, so what is this? What is this? What is this function which is uh, looking somewhat as a derivative? It's not a derivative, of course. Uh, look here. For example, we take n uh, to n, n we can uh, uh, represent uh, in a base p expansion. Uh, to the base p expansion, it correspond the the strings of uh, uh, the string of uh, um, uh, figures. So, so this is a sort of uh, a, a word. We send this word to our automaton, then. This way we switch our automaton to, to a certain state and we uh, take this state as an initial and consider all these functions. So these, these are functions, this set of functions, which can be, which can be obtained from our automaton. Uh, uh, these are all automata functions which can be obtained from our automaton, but, but by fixing uh, 
all the uh, its state of the our automaton as initial by taking the state as initial. Of course, of course, automaton is finite if the number or uh, if the pair was there are only a finite number of uh, one uh, there are only pairwise distinct number of uh, of pair pairwise distinct functions of this form by now then by using uh, this uh, this idea and playing with uh, uh, base uh, playing with wonderful series uh, uh, it is possible to prove to prove this uh, this theorem to prove this theorem now, uh, now, actually, uh, uh, actually, um, but my time, my time is over, and uh, 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 maybe th th this is good because uh, 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 this is the right moment uh, um, uh, where I, I should uh, uh, where I should uh, 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 stop because we are now going to consider special classes. Uh, special classes of uh, uh, of um, uh, one Lipschitz functions, which are also important. So, <clears throat> questions, comments. I, I, I think uh, I see. Thank, that there are... thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, uh, let, let's check if there are questions. Uh, okay. Okay. So, are there questions? Okay, no? so, uh, any any questions in the room? Okay, I, I, I don't see either any question in, in the chat. So I think, I think we, are, we are okay. Let's thank you, Professor Ross. And thank okay. you for, for this. Okay, thank you for the attention. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, I constantly, uh, I constantly uh, update uh, the, uh, um, uh, the presentation. So uh, I will send a new version uh, today. Uh, and tomorrow, I hope I will send again a new version. Uh, but if you have uh, questions, you can uh, send it me via, via email, for example, or, or ask me tomorrow or in some other places. So thank you for the attention. Uh, and uh, 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 till tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Okay. Uh, so now, now we have a break. We resume at 11. Uh, let, me, let me say, especially for the people who is online, that... Uh, uh, a word of apology, because yesterday we suffered a black uh, a blackout here at the, at CIMAD, and the, the internet service went down. So that's the reason we don't we don't have the the last conference of the day. This one is going to be rescheduled, and we will let you know uh, in the order. Uh, an announcement for the people here in the room today at uh, five. Uh, oh, yeah. at, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, 10 minutes for five, we're gonna, no, at five, at five, we're gonna gather to get the, the, the conference picture. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, we come back at 11. Thank you. What are you posting the videos? Uh, they will be posted later. What? Uh, either at the YouTube channel of Pimat or at the you know, the problem is the problem. We will let you put it. I
Sorbido, yo no sé si es cuando se mueve la. Sí, me, me tengo que quitar eso porque rocío un ruido extrañísimo. Yo pensé que era alguien que tenía. Que tenía. No, 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 que tenía algún tipo de problema porque siempre sonaba algo, pero parece que era la. ¿Qué era la qué? ¿Qué era? Hola, hola. El problema es que tal vez tengo que colocarlo más arriba, a ver. Hola, hola. ¿No se escuchan? Hola, hola. Hola, hola. Alguien mejor. Un poquito más arriba. Hola, hola. Sí, ahí se escucha mejor. Gracias.
Okay, so um, let's resume our morning session with the with the uh, second lecture of the course by uh, Professor Diernas and Zuniga uh, Galindo, uh, introduction of uh, to periodic analysis. So please, Wilson, when you're ready. Thank you. Okay, let, let me begin by reviewing the, 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 the formula for, for the change of variables that I presented in the, in the previous and yesterday. So, suppose that K0 and K1 are compact subsets of QPN. And that F is a function with domain in K0 taking values in the field of complex numbers, we assume that this function is continuous. And suppose that we are interested in this integral, the integral over k0 of the function f with respect to the hard mesh. Here, we perform, oh, I, I forgot something. Let me, let me put an additional hypothesis, suppose that H is a analytic map from K1 to K0. So we use H, this map, as a change of variables in this integral. So here, we are performing this change of variables. X is capital H of Y. Then this integral becomes the integral over K1. Now, we replace x by h of y. Now, we have to find the new measure. The new measure is given by the determinant of the Jacobian matrix of the change of variables. And then, we have to take the periodic value the absolute value, and here we have the normal phase hard measure. Comments or questions about this, this formula? Okay, now I want to discuss the example, example of 4.2 in my notes. In this example, we, have, we work with two open sets. And the first one is U, which is QP minus this number. The second open set is 
is B, which is QP minus A over C, uh, A, B, C, and D are PI numbers. We assume that C is different from zero. Now we have an analytic mapping defined in the set U taking values in V. This is the definition. Whereby is this rational function AX plus B, CX plus D. Okay. Probably some of you know that this is a nebulous map. And really, we are performing. Uh, this is really, we, we are seeing um, the, the action of a Mews map, which is now to define the, the projected line in, in, a, in an apartment car. Okay, but do, do not worry about this. So the point is that this is an analytic function. Uh, this function is analytic at any point. Where the denominator doesn't match. This is like in the classical case. Okay. Now we are interested. Okay. Uh, it is it is easy to check that this map is by analytic. The inverse is given by this formula x is dy minus b this is the inverse we assume that a times d minus b times c is different from c really this this map is associated with a matrix a b c d and this condition says that the determinant of this matrix is different from zero. Okay. What is B? B. This thing? A, B, C, and D are the right now. But, but in the set, you have D over C. This is, uh, this is B. You have D over C and A over C. Yes. Why is there in both cases? Minus D over C. Okay, but let, let, let us check if there is a typo. We have to discard the zeros and the points of this function. A over B. So we have to discard, uh, the function is defined if A is minus D over C and the other is, is, uh, is A over, no, this is correct. So B is another part. A, B, C, and D are parameters, no? You only have to discard the form, right? Yes. The point is that we are, this map, this map is well defined at any point where the denominator is different from zero. There is just one pole. This is the pole. The inverse, this function is analytic at any point where the denominator is different from zero. There is one pole. You have to discard this pole. That's it. Okay. So suppose now that we are interested that uh, phi is a function, it's a test function. Uh, okay, let me correct something. It's dimension one. Really, we are working in dimension one. Okay, no, 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 sorry, sorry. This is general, okay, no, no. This is the general uh, formula for the change of variables. But this example, we are in dimension one. So now, let's take phi, a function from QP into C, a test function. This means that this function is a linear combination of characteristic functions of both. In addition, the support of any function is compact. Why compact? Because the support 
is a union of a finite number of balls. And the balls are compact. Okay. Now, suppose that we are interested in the following integral. We want to compute the following integral. I'm going to write here. The integral, no, I'm going to write here. The integral over V of phi of y dy. And we want to use this map as a change of map. This is a analytic map. So, this uh, uh, function gives a, a, a change of variables, okay? So now we have to write here u, okay? We have to replace, I'm gonna write again here, the change of variables, y is 8x plus b, cx plus d. So here we have to replace x by, by, by y, sorry, y by, by this expression. Now, we have to apply the theorem. And I have a question for you guys. Can we apply the theorem? Notice that in the statement of this theorem, we have two compact sets. But here, the situation is different. We are working with two open sets. So what if we can use the formula, the, the theorem, this theorem to perform a change of variables. Exactly, that's the point. Really the integral is this integral and this integral. Here we have, let me change the color. This is the, the, the domain of integration is the intersection of it with the support of this function. And this is, uh, and this is a constant, okay? Good. So now we have to compute the Jacobian. The point is that this is that we have to compute the derivative of y with respect to x. Here we can use a standard calculus. Why? Because in the computation of the derivative of this function at some point, we assume that the function is represented by a convergent power. And then we know how to compute the derivative of, of a power of series, of a convergent power of series. So we use a standard calculus. So this means that the derivative is given by the square of the denominator. Now the derivative of the numerator is A times the denominator, cx plus d minus, now the derivative of the denominator, which is c times the numerator. So we get the a times b minus d times c, the determinant over the square, okay? Uh, sure. How important is the compact hypothesis in that theory? Because if the inter support of P, if the ball is inside the support of P, the intersection is probably not a close, it's not probably a compact set. You are thinking in over the reals. Okay? okay, this is not, not really. Suppose that this is just a ball. So the intersection is going to give you a ball. This is a ball. Suppose this is just a ball and it's an open set. So now, the intersection is going, to, is going to give you a ball or a, let's say an open set, but this is a union of balls. Okay? And balls are compact. But this is simple. I mean, uh, in this case, we can apply this theorem because phi has compact support, and this is the explanation. But, but uh, the question is about why we need here. Yes, my question is especially because how you know that the intersection is a compact set? The point is, it, you can't it. use the, the intuition over the real. It's not going to work. That's the point. Okay, now let, let me let me write here the 
Okay, let me see. Yeah, is the determinant A times L? I, I, uh, I don't know. Is A times D minus B, C. So here we have to put the absolute value of the determinant divided by the absolute value of this expression squared and then dy. Okay. Okay, so the purpose of this exercise was to show this formula. This formula is, is, is relevant in certain calculation. Yes, thank you. Okay. Now, do you have comments or questions? Now, I want to present an important calculation. Um, I don't, this, this calculation is in my notes. Okay. We, this is an introduction. This is the first example of a Cobanils in string amplitude. So we, we need this example. I don't remember, I, I, I don't put in my notes the, 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 the number, the exercise number, but there's just one calculation about the string theory in, 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 my, in my notes. Okay, so suppose Koba Nielsen, Nielsen, Doka, Sita, Ohms. Okay. In the, in the course by Professor Compea, we're going to give more, more information about this object. But right now, suppose that n is greater than or equal to 4. Um, we have several complex variables. OK? These are complex variables depending on two indices. These are complex variables, complex numbers. And j runs from 2 to n minus 2. S i j is also a complex number. But now, a and j satisfy this condition. OK. The now, now, we use this notation as it's a vector notation is it's a vector consisting of all these complex numbers. This is an element of C D and D C, which is the number of, of complex of, of complex variables, is exactly n n minus three divided by two. Now I'm gonna write here. This is the Koba. Nielsen local zeta function is an integral over Q P n minus three. Now here we have a product J equals two n minus two x J P x one J one minus x J x n minus one j, then we have another product. And here we have x i, x j, p, x i, j. And now if the measure, the measure okay, so this is the hard measure, the normalized hard measure of these space. Okay, the first observation is this is a formal object. I mean, you do not know if this integral is conversed. Okay. So we need a regularization process. I'm going to explain the regularization process. Regularization, this is not. I'm going to use this simplification. Regularization means to make sense of this, of this integral. To make sense of this object, give a definition. Okay. This is complicated. I'm just going to consider the case 
of four particles. Okay. Yeah, what is that definition of the functions by uh, I what is the motivation? Yes. The point is, no, but okay. I'm gonna answer it in the easy way. Uh, you have to attend the, the, the course on, on, on the string analysis. <laughs> yeah, because uh, yeah, that's, that's the answer. Okay, so let us consider the case. Uh, oh my goodness. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Okay, mm. let me try. Now, I'm gonna consider, okay, this is not working. The case n equals four, four parts. In this case, this integral takes the form, the following form. Okay, here we put the number of particles, and this is very simple. This is a, this is a one dimensional integral. I'm gonna use just one variable here, x, one, two, here. dx, okay? Again, we don't know anything about the convergence of this integral. Notice that we don't have a test function in the integral. So the convergence of this integral is, is not easy. It's, so we are gonna do the following. We are gonna define, this is a definition. Let me change the code. We're gonna, this is a definition. So we understand this integral in this form. The integral over the unit ball, now we write, and we write again, a function. Plus the integral over the complement of the unit ball. Notice that this is a definition. I mean, if this function is integrable, then this is just a theory and a fact assertion. But due to the fact that we don't know anything about the convergence of this integral, this is a definition. Okay, I'm gonna call this the first integral is C4 zero of s and the second integral is z1 okay now i'm going to study the first integral okay okay so notice that this the, the domain of integration of the first integral is the unit ball. We know that the unit ball is a disjoint union of balls of this form. Oh, let me. Okay. So we use this is a part. It is a partition of the domain of integration. So the first integral is. The sum from j0 to p minus 1 integral over this ball of this function. Okay. Now I have to introduce more notation by definition. I'm going to call this integral 
And when I use this symbol for this integral, uh, let me see the symbol. This is where zero is a comma. Okay. So now we have to study these integrals. Comment or questions? Okay. Uh, now back to this. So let us consider the case in which J I'm getting a call. The case in which J is different from zero and one. Okay. So we are studying this integral. Okay. Now, we need a remark here. Okay. Happy a number with no one is a unit. Okay. Now, A has an expansion of the form A0 plus, uh, let me, let me, I have to put here, an element in the unit ball with norm one is a unit. Okay. This is and now the expansion of this element is a0, a1, p, a2, p squared, and so on. So a is a unit if and only if the first digit is different from zero. Okay, so we need this characterization to compute this integral. Notice that. X is running, X is taking values of this form, J plus P X theta. Okay? And J is different from zero and one. Then, this X is a unit. So this absolute value is one. Okay? This means that the absolute value is one. Now, let us consider the second term. One minus X is one minus J minus P is tilde. Now here, the first digit is different from zero. Why? Because J is different from zero and one. So again, this element is a unit, which means that the norm of one minus X is one. Then, we are just computing the volume of this ball. But in the computation of the volume of this ball, we can describe J, the center, because the measure is invariant in the translation. Now we have to compute the volume of this ball, and the volume is exactly the radius of the ball, which is e to the minus one. Notice that we have exactly P minus two integrals of this type. But uh, in the last line, you said that A zero different from zero, but A zero is from one to two minus one. Yes. In that case, it's then negative one minus J. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, the point is, okay, I, I don't want to, uh, okay, I, I want to think, the point is the following. QP is a field. So, this number should be represented 
as I have to use another notation, let's say uh, B0 plus B1P and so on, where the indices where these, uh, these are between zero and P minus one. Okay, I, I can do the calculation really here. You have to put one minus J mod P. And then you have to change this. Okay, but <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, let me go back to my to my observation. We have p minus two integrals of this type. Now mm, we have to consider the case in which j is zero. Okay. Now the case case j. So we are studying this integral zero over zero. The integral is now the center is zero, so we have p c p, and here we have x dx. Okay. Again, the absolute value one minus x when x runs through this ball takes this is a unit. So here we have PCP x p dx. Okay, because this is a unit. Again, we are using that the, you have to expand one minus x when x is an element of this set, and then the conclusion is that the first digit in the expansion is different from zero. The first digit is one. So this is a unit. Now we perform a change of variables here. I'm going to say uh, x is y times p. OK, so the x is p to the minus one dy. And this integral becomes. Okay, now I'm going to continue here. So it's okay. Remember, the absolute value is a multiplicative function. So the absolute value of p is p to the minus one. So for this reason, we get p to the minus x12. And then we have this integral. Yesterday, we computed an n dimensional version of this integral. So, I'm going to give you the result. The result is this term times divided Okay. I mean, it is important to know that this identity is valid if the real part of H12 is greater than minus one. Okay? But I'm gonna, because it is important, at the end of the calculation, it is important to know where this integral uh, is holomorphic. But I'm, I'm, I'm gonna skip this, this calculation. I'm just gonna sh show you the calculation. Okay, comments or questions? Okay, now we need. Let me put it one more case. Okay. The case J equals one. Okay. Is similar. Now we are computing this integral. The integral the center of the ball is one. OK, 
okay? The, the value of x is one. One more time, x is running on this set. Any element in this set is a unit, so this is one. So we get this integral. Now we perform a change of variables. X is one plus py. Dx is p minus one dy. So the integral becomes Or is that the inside we have? I'm gonna put this here. Uh, X minus one is p y. So if you change the sign, get this. Okay. So we need the absolute value of this expression, which is the absolute value of this expression. Now. This is a calculation. And we have this integral. And we know the value of this integral. The value, let me try to write here. Again, the value of this integral is exactly this term. Now, this rational function. Okay, now we can write the formula for the integral. Okay, I have to erase this. For the integral. For this integral, I'm going to give you the formula. It is necessary to add all these integrals, okay? And the formula is this: p minus two. Remember, we have exactly p minus two integrals of this type, and then we have other integrals to to Okay, now we have to compute the last integral. Remember that. The integral is the one, is the integral over the complement of the unit pole. Okay. To compute this integral, we have to know the following. Suppose that x, that this condition holds, then the absolute value of this sum is exactly the maximum between the absolute value of x and the absolute value of y. Okay? If we use this result, then one, the absolute value is exactly the max between the absolute value of one, which is one, and the absolute value of x. Notice that here, let me use another code. This is the domain of integration, okay? 
If X belongs, if, if X is a point in this set, then the piano absolute value is greater than Y. Why? Because this point is supposed to be in the complement of the unit ball. The unit ball consists of all the points with absolute value less than or equal to one. So we have this condition. For this reason, the, the, the norm of this element is one, the norm of x is greater than one. For this reason, we can use this, this, this result. And then we have this. This means that this integral is exactly this. Okay. Now, I'm gonna continue here. Next one. Uh, here. This set is the region union of spheres, one-dimensional spheres of radius j from when j takes values from one to infinity. I mean, remember this the definition of this set. This is a set of periodic numbers such that the norm is exactly p to the j. So this is a partition of the domain of integration. By using this partition, we have that this integral is a sum, it's a this series. Okay. Now we, we rewrite this uh, form p to the j times the unit. Okay. This is a mistake. Uh, put minus. Okay. Now we change variables. x is p to the minus j times y. Dx is p to the. And then this series becomes. I'm going to put the result. The question is p to the minus j. Okay. This term comes from this absolute value using this, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this variable. And then we have p to the j. Uh, okay, now we have to compute the measure. So, Okay. It's just simple. I'm going to continue here for this series. This series takes form. Uh, I, have a, I have a mistake here. It should be positive because there is a minus here. Okay. So we get this equation. Now we use the geometric series to get this result. Okay. In this way, we obtain a metamorphic uh, continuation of the Koba Nielsen string amplitude in the case of four points. Let me check the time. Do you have comments or questions? If you see my notes, my notes, my notes, uh, uh, there are more details in, in my notes. Okay. Uh, okay, guys. Uh, let us take a break of 10 minutes. I think we need a break. I need a break. Okay, so it's 11.42. Well, or is it too much? <laughs> it's more than 10, but I need more than 10. Okay, uh, 12. It's okay.
Hola. Claro, estaba en la mitad de una conferencia.
excepto mañana entonces
Okay, let me let me repeat. Okay, in, in, in the last hour, I plan to give some ideas about the Fourier transform in the PRI framework. So let me begin by, by recalling some ideas about additive characters. So let us consider a PRI number different from zero. Then this PRI number has an expansion of this form, let's say x minus n, fifty minus n. Then x minus one, p to the minus one, then x zero, x one p, and so on. This part of the expansion is the fractional part is the fractional part of x and is denoted by this symbol. So the fractional part of any periodic of any periodic number is a rational number. Okay, because this is a rational number. Now uh, Now, the standard additive character, chi p x, is defined as exponential 2 pi i, this i, this is root of minus 1, times the fractional part of x. Okay? Notice that if x is a periodic integer, then the, partial, uh, the, the fractional part is zero because the periodic expansion of x doesn't contain negative powers of p. For this reason, the, 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 this function and the value of this function is zero. And then the restriction of this standard character to the unit ball is just one. For every, I mean, I'm going to put x here. For any point in the unit ball, OK? Now, so this is the, the, the this is the, the standard additive character of Q, QP. Now, some properties. First property. 
this is a, the, the complex norm is one. In other words, uh, this means that this complex number belongs to the unit circle, to the complex unit circle. Second property, this property says that QB that this character is an algebraic morphism. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a morphism of ability groups. Okay. Also, the complex conjugate, the bar means the complex conjugate is one divided by this expression, and also this is the standard character evaluated at minus x, and this is valid for any x in QP. Now, an important property is that the standard additive character is not identically one for x in the complement of the union. In other words, this means that there is x0 in this set such that this complex number is different. Okay. Now this is takes, this is an example in, in my notes. In this example, we have to compute this integral. The integral. Okay. We can rewrite this integral in this way. The integral over QP and then we, we, we have to put here the characteristic function of this ball, which is this symbol. This is a Fourier transform of the characteristic function of this ball. Okay. So we are supposed to show that this integral satisfies this formula. We can rewrite this expression. Notice that basically this formula says that the that the it, it, it's psi belongs to, a, to 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 the to the to the to the ball with center is zero and radius p to the minus r. The value of the function is pr, and outside of this ball, the value of the function is zero. So we can rewrite this in this way. This is p to the r times this expression. And this function is the character function of this ball. Okay. So, in order to verify this formula, we have to consider two cases. In the first case, the parameter psi is less than or equal p to the minus r. This is the first case. We know that x. satisfies this condition. Why? Because X is an element of this ball. The ball with center at the origin and radius P to the R. 
Now, we can conclude using the part that the, that the absolute value, the PR regards to value is a multiplicative function, that the absolute value of this product is less than or equal to one. Okay? This means that this number belongs to the unit ball. And we know, and then this implies that this function, that the value of this function is one, because the standard additive character is trivial on the unit ball. In other words, under this condition, let me get a core. This is not working. Under, under this condition, the integral is exactly uh, so this is this is this is one. So we have to compute the volume of this ball, which is p to the r, and this is valid if the parameter psi satisfies this condition. Okay, comments or questions? Well, so there is there is a question on, on the chat. So okay. my yes goes as is if is the fractional part the fractional part is zero in the exponential. I didn't get it. Really. If the fractional part, yeah, the, the, the fractional part is zero. Let me write here. The fractional part is zero. This means that X belongs to the unit ball. So, would you repeat the question, uh, Edwin, please? Yeah, yeah, I, I, apparently it, it is, she's happy with your answer, so. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Now we have to consider the other case. In the other case, the parameter, is the parameter satisfy this condition is greater than p to the minus r notice that this is equivalent to say that this absolute value is greater than or equal to this power okay the next part. Now, there is x0 in the sphere with radius p to the r. In other words, the norm of this element is p to the r, such that the product of psi times x0. Notice that this, this, is great, this is greater than or equal to P, okay? Uh, okay. Uh, by using these two formulas, and again, the fact that the, the, the absolute value is a multiplicative function, we get this, this thing one. Okay. Now, another question is why there is x zero. Basically, uh, I mean, it, it is it, it, there is an x zero satisfying this, this this condition. Okay, it is an exercise. Okay. Now, this means this means that. x0 times psi doesn't belong to the unit ball. Remember, 
To be an element of the unit ball means that the PRD norm is less or equal to one, but here the norm is greater than or equal to three. So this element doesn't belong to the unit ball. Okay. Then we can assume that by choosing x0, we can assume that this complex number is different from one. Okay. Now we change variables as, as follows in the interval, in this interval. Okay, because the, the, the hard measure is invariant under translation. Now we have to determine the new domain of integration. Now, from this formula, y is x minus x0. And in the integration, x is an element of this ball. Okay. Also, notice this means that x. Also, x0 satisfies this condition. Why? Because x0 was selected in this way. Okay. Now, this means that x0 is a point in this ball. One important property in, 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 the, in the case of the periodic numbers is that any point in the ball can be considered as the center of the ball. So from here, okay, we, we can say that x that x belongs to the ball with center in x0 and values. Uh, uh, okay, I have to change the, the, the side because I have to change this side. It doesn't matter. Okay. This point belongs to this ball. Then we can use this point as a center of the ball. Now x belongs to this ball. Okay. So what is the conclusion of this? The conclusion of this reasoning is that the y also belongs to this ball. But we can change again the center. And the center is zero. In the case in which the center is zero, we don't write. We don't put zero. Okay, in the center is zero, we omit this example. Okay. So now uh, we change variables. Let me use another. We have we are computing the okay. Now I need to follow because this is not working. We are computing this integral. We are changing variables in this way. We know that the domain of integration is PR by this reasoning. Now here we have to replace, in, in, instead of x, we have to put y plus x0. And then this mesh, OK? Using this. Now we know that this integral it can be written in this way times but now this expression is the original integral so we get this complex number times the original integral okay so in conclusion i times this complex number minus one is zero. But we selected x zero such that this number is different from one. So the conclusion is r is zero, which means this integral is zero under this hypothesis on the parameter is okay? Comments or questions? Okay. Now I have to 
remember some ideas about functional spaces, let them function spaces. Okay, suppose that rho is a number, a real number, satisfying this condition. Now we have this space. This is a function belongs to L rho if and only if F is a function from QPN. To Z is the first condition, is measurable and satisfies. I'm going to write the other condition here. And, and this number this is raw. This is raw. This part. Okay. So this is a spatial rule. Uh, I'm not going to give more details about these spaces. Now, I also need the case in which rho is infinity. In this case, the space L infinity. Consists of all the functions satisfying that this number essential supremum of f of x when x runs to QPA. Is fine. Thank you. Okay. The okay. Okay. What is the meaning of this last condition? Uh, this condition says that F is bounded for any X in QPN except when X belongs to a set L, but this set L satisfies that the hard measure of L is zero. Okay. Okay, I need these spaces to explain to be a transform. Okay, now another ingredient is the following by linear form. I need a linear form. Suppose that X is a vector in QPN and Psi is also a vector in QPN. We define this object as this sum. So this object is a linear form this object is not an inner product okay now suppose that we have 
an integrable function. If f is an integrable function, so f is a function from QPN with values in C, we define the Fourier transform in order in this way of this function by this integral. Okay. This is the Fourier transform of F. Uh, other notations. Comments or questions about the definition of the Fourier transform? Okay. This hypothesis is essential. Why? If we compute the complex models of this function, so if we compute this number. Then this is less than or equal. Uh, this number because the absolute the, the, the complex norm of the, of this character is one. Okay. And this is exactly the, the norm in L1, which is finite because F belongs to L1. So under this hypothesis, if F is integrable, then the Fourier transform is well defined. Okay. Other questions? Now, using let me use this this inequality. I'm going to take now the soup. So you see. This expression is exactly this norm. And this inequality says that this norm is less than this norm. Uh, let me mention, I'm not going to show this. I'm going to put a remark here that if F is integrable, then the Fourier transform is continuous. Comments or questions? Okay, now I have to introduce some operators. Okay. Okay, the translation operator. The translation operator. Suppose that H is a vector in QPN and F is a function from QPN into C. We define Po. H, this is, a, this is an operator acting on F by this formula. This is a new function, and this function is F of X minus H. So this operator performs a translation on the function F. Now, this is an exercise. If suppose that F is integrable, then the Fourier transform of this function is given by this expression. Okay. 
This means that if we perform a translation in, in, in the variable x, then the Fourier transform is multiplied by a count, by the standard count. Okay, this is this is simple literature. This is this is simple. I'm, I'm gonna skip this. Another exercise. Again, we have to, to assume that f is integrable. Now we want to compute the Fourier transform. Of this function. Now we have a product of a function times a standard additive character. And we want to compute the Fourier transform of this expression. The Fourier transform of this expression is the Fourier transform of F evaluated at psi plus H. And this is exactly tau of minus H acting in the Fourier transform. The verification of this, of this is extremely simple. Okay. Any other questions? This is an exercise in my interest. Okay. Capital delta of K is, is a characteristic function of a certain ball. I'm going to write, I'm going to repeat the definition. So this is one if the norm of X is a dynamical. If the k, you have to pay attention to the signs. Zero if the norm is greater than the k. Notice that the limit when k tends to infinity of this sequence is the constant function one. In addition, this function is a test function. Okay. I also need this function, lowercase delta, evaluated in K in X, by definition is PKN, now omega. This means that this function takes the value p to k n if the norm of x is less than or equal to p to k zero. You know, otherwise. Now. This function satisfies this property. Okay. Also, the limit k to infinity of delta k x has this form. If x is different from zero, is zero and infinite if x is zero, okay, from here. Uh, there is a, uh, okay, 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 I uh, have, have an error here. Notice that k is big, we have the norm of x is very small, okay? For this reason, in the limit, when, when, when x, when k tends to infinity, at the origin, we get 
infinity. Okay. If k is big, in the limit, there is just one point, which is the origin, and the value is infinity. Other one is zero. This is the Dirac. This is the Dirac function or distribution. Okay. Now, the purpose of this exercise is to show that the Fourier transform of this function is this function. Okay. okay. Comments or questions? Okay. Let's do this calculation. Well, let me. The Fourier transform of this function is by definition okay. And remember, this function is just the function of this ball. So here we have to integrate over the set of all vectors with norm less than or equal to p to the k. Notice that we can write this set in this form, p to the minus k, the n-dimensional ball. And this is good. I mean, this notation is good. Why? Because we now change variables in this way. x is running through this set. OK? Now, is P K N and then by performing the change of variables, this integral becomes the integral over the n dimensional unit ball. Now we have a constant term outside of the integral. Now inside of the integral, we have P to the minus K Y. Okay, now we have to use a calculation. We did this calculation before. The calculation says the following. I'm going to write the calculation in, 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 in a, different, a different way. The Fourier transform of the unit ball, this is the characteristic function of the unit ball. The Fourier transform is the characteristic function of the unit ball, but now in the variable side. Okay, so if we use this result here, here we are computing the Fourier transform of the unit ball, but now we are evaluating in the point in this ball. Okay, and this is precisely, let me see, uh, the result. Okay. Comments or questions? Okay, now we have a result. This is a lemma. This is the space of test functions defined in QPN. And this is the Fourier transform. The mapping, I want to write, the mapping. 
is a well defined linear uh, operator. Okay, this means that the state of this function is invariant under the action of the Fourier transform. For this reason, we use the name of test functions for the test function. Okay, this is very simple. Why? Because we have to remember. I mean, we have to remember that a test function is a linear combination of characteristic functions of balls. Now, here I'm going to use delta. This is another notation for the characteristic function of a ball with radius p to the ki at the center at this point. Okay, we can rewrite this expression in this form. Okay, we can use the operator to the translation. Okay, remember. The action of this operator gives exactly this function. Okay. Now we compute the Fourier transform. The Fourier transform is linear. So we have to compute the Fourier transform of this expression to uh -huh by using an exercise, we know that the Fourier transform is a product of this character. That is the Fourier transform, I'm gonna write here, the Fourier transform of this function. So in the last step, we get this expression. Oh, it's a uh, small, sorry. Okay, this is the Fourier transform. Now the we have to check that this is a test function. Here, this is an exercise, but here we need some ideas. To check, O phi is a test function if and only if the function satisfies two properties. The function is locally constant and this is the first condition and the second condition, the support of the function is compact. Okay. Notice that this, this function has compact support. For this reason, this product, this function has compact support. So we have to verify the first condition. Let me explain the first condition. The first condition means the following. Suppose that this is a perturbation, x prime is a perturbation of x. The function, that, the value of the function doesn't change if the perturbation x prime is very small, if x prime belongs to a ball, an n-dimensional dimension, an ball with some values with central origin. Of course, this L in principle belongs to x. In general, it's possible to show that this L is independent of x. Okay? So now the, the last step is to check that this function 
is locally constant. It's an exercise. Comments or questions? Oh, let me check the time. Yeah, perfect. So, Now we have a theorem. The map is the Fourier transform where. Is a well defined operator with inverse This is the formula for the inverse Fourier transform, and this is the formula for the Fourier transform. With the inverse given by, in addition, the mapping. Answers. Is an isomorphism of C vector space. Okay, this is, let's say, the most basic result about the Fourier transform. Okay, in my notes, you have this result and you have some generalizations of this result. But I'm going to stop here, guys. The, the, the purpose of my of my course was essentially to to introduce the basic aspects of of periodic analysis, emphasizing you know examples. Do you have comments or questions? Okay, oh, by the way, guys, there is an exercise session on Wednesday at the end of the day. So if you have comments or questions, we can talk uh, tomorrow, I think, at the end of the day, exercise session. Thank you. Any, any questions in the room? Uh, I, don't, I don't see any questions in the chat. Not so far. Okay, so, so let's thank you, Wilson, and, and, uh, and let's stop for the uh, lunch break. Okay, bye bye. Guys. Thank 
Pero cualquier espacio de funciones Ahora sigue el curso de para integrar o sea, si no hay impacto no hay gran
Bueno, de hecho, Nacho ya le salía el día antes de hacer el y luego, entonces, habíamos quedado en un sitio y yo me que estaba en la chica y le dije, y me 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 dije, pero vamos, bueno, ¿sabes qué? Lo bueno es eso, va a ser la risa, puede ir a... Ok, lo que estamos haciendo es que se me hace falta, ¿sabes? Sí, el semestre anterior se dio un traje. Ah. Okay, are we ready, guys? Okay, so um, okay, so um, let's resume. Um, and uh, is it is the time to to start with the new course? Uh, Uh, given by Edwin Leo Cardenal from CIMAR. Uh, so he is currently sabbatical in Spain, and that's the reason he's, he's gonna use Zoom to, 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 to teach the course. And um, uh, the title of the course is Introduction to Local Setup. Yes. Um, well, you already Edwin. Okay, thanks, Manuel, for the introduction. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, yes. uh, as Manuel was saying, I was planning to 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 be there. <laughs> I was supposed to be there. Um, sorry about that. Uh, it, this is it. It, it wasn't uh, like I was thinking about. But um, anyway, I am here and I am happy to, to be with there with you guys. So let's start with this course. So, um, okay. So uh, first I want to remind you that the, the notes for this course are available on the web page of the, of the, of the conference. So, um, The, the the article that we are using for this course corresponds more or less 
this this course, this mini course on introduction to local set functions corresponds to the second part, more or less the half, the second half of the of the paper of the article that is on the website. Okay, so that's that is uh, my starting point. So I'm going to start to to telling you uh, what is a local city function. So maybe do you remember for for the lecture by Wilson yesterday? Uh, he was using this this. He was using this example. Okay, uh, I guess in in n dimensions. But anyway, what is this? The thing is, what we have here is a an integral over the periodic numbers. Just ignore this this term for one moment. Ignore ignore this. So what we have here is that x is a periodic variable, and then we are taking the the absolute value, the periodic absolute value, and then we take a parameter s that is a complex number, and we use this uh, to raise the norm, the norm of x to the power s, okay? So in this sense, this integral becomes a parametric integral depending on the complex parameter s, okay? So all the classical, uh, the classical complex analysis applies, okay? This is the, the, first, the first thing that I want to know. So this integral is, is well-defined. I mean, this integral converges uh, for the real part of, part of S greater than minus one, okay? This is by definition. But in fact, what you saw in the, in the example that we'll soon explain yesterday was that this integral is actually equal to this thing. This is, sorry for my handwriting, it's, it's terrible right now, but this is the only thing they have. So, okay. So what we saw yesterday was that this integral is actually equals to this fraction, okay? So as complex functions, these functions are equal. So this is, this is an extension. This is an extension of this function, but now this function is defined for every, for every, complex number with the real part of S greater than minus one, okay? Uh, sorry, different from minus one. Okay. So this phenomenon is what is called a metamorphic continuation. Okay, these things that say, say here is called metamorphic continuation. So you begin with a function that is defining some region, this is region, and then you do something, and uh, this function equals to the, the 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 function that you begin with, and you end up with uh, some function that is defined in a larger set. Okay, so this is this is the principle of metamorphic continuation. So this is something that happens not just for that example. So I I want to 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 take many many uh, things from this example. The first thing is that um, you can do it. You can do this for any uh, function. So our first definition. For the first definition of our theta function, we are going to take a polynomial in n variables. 
So you can take the norm of this polynomial and raise this to the power of, uh, to the power S, okay? And S is again a, a complex number with real part of S greater than zero. This integral converges, okay? In this half plane. So the question is, does this, that integral admit symmetric continuation? And moreover, if we know uh, this metamorphic continuation was really special because this is a metamorphic continuation as a rational function, okay? This is a rational function of depending on the parameter p to the minus s. So we can ask if this definition, this is a local zeta function. This local zeta function admits metamorphic continuation. This is the first question. The second question is, is this metamorph, is this zeta function equals to, equal to a rational function of P to the minus S? So the first thing is metamorphic continuation. And the second one is rationality. So we need more evidence to decide in order to, to know if these things are true or not, okay? So one example that we are going to, to, to do in this session is the following one. If you consider x squared minus y cubed and then compute the local city function attached to this function, we will see that this is a rational function depending on p to the minus s, okay? So this is a rational function, let me put it in this way p over q dependent on p to the minus s, that is like a capital P, okay? So this is a rational function dependent on p to the minus s. So our target, our main goal today is to develop some theory in order to compute this, this uh, type of integrals and try to answer these questions. And for the second part of the course, we will see that um, there are some other techniques in order to compute these, these guys, and that these guys are really connected with uh, singularity theory, with singularity theory, number theory, analysis, and so on, okay. Mathematical physics, and so on. So that, that, that is the plan, okay? So, so far, there are any questions? Excuse me, Edwin, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. In the, in the second example, um, don't we need to remove the fiber of zero, of zero from the... Uh, yeah, you can do that, but uh, anyway, this this is a set of measure zero, so you can oh, take okay. this, but take this out, but this is a set of measure zero, so it doesn't matter. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, so let's put our hands on. So the first connection that I want to make is uh, with a classical object in number theory. Okay, so I'm going to take this, this definition 
uh, of the zeta function. This is the C, CP to the n, and this is our definition of the of the local zeta function. They are also called Igusa's zeta function because Junichi Igusa was one of the main uh, researchers that has developed a lot of the theory of local zeta functions. So um, I'm going to write this integral in this way. So we use this, this um, the composition of the of CP to the n. So you just remember that CP to the n can be right in the following way. CP minus zero equals to the this is the this joint union of sets of balls. Maybe you, you have used this or Wilson have used this in some of the computations that he has made. This is j from zero to the infinity. But anyway, it, it is not, it's not difficult to convince ourselves that this is true, okay? So in this case, I'm going to use more than this. I'm going to use uh, a condition depending on the absolute value of the function f norm of f equals to pi to the minus j. So this is a truly, a truly e equality, okay? So this is the first thing that I need. So, but the thing is that in this set, this function is constant because this is ex exactly what I want here, okay? So this is constant and equals pi to the minus j, okay? So this is the series pi to the minus j s, and then we have the measure of this set, right? For the measure, I'm going to use uh, this, this mu, okay? This mu means the measure of this guy, okay? The PI measure. So in order to, to, to deal with this, this measure, in order to compute this measure, let me just write the set. This is this set or the set that I put in brackets here is exactly this same set, okay? So for psychological reasons, I'm going to switch to the order, to the periodic valuation, okay? This will be easy, easy for us. So this condition means that uh, the order of the function f to the x, uh, f applied to x equals exactly j. Okay, this J, this number J. So this set can be decomposed because the periodic valuation is discrete. This can be decomposed as the set of the uh, numbers for which the periodic valuation or the periodic order is greater than J. And then you mod out the set of uh, values where this is greater than j plus one, okay? And then we're going to focus on this, this other set, this guy, okay? So for this guy, then I'm going to name this guy star. Uh, we need some, 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 some preparations. So, <clears throat> First, I want to take, uh, I want to consider X of this form. So X will be uh, of the form X zero for some X zero plus pi, G, pi J, pi to the J for C, for C in CPN, okay? Because I want to, I want to play with this order, okay? With this J. So I'm going to assume that my periodic number X has a periodic decomposition or a periodic series in this way, okay? Write it in this way. So whenever I want to, to, to check this condition, 
this condition equals exactly to, to this one. And the key point is that this condition can be understood in terms of these guys. Because note that uh, if we apply Taylor's theorem to this function f of x0 plus pi j, what we get is f of x0 plus pi j, pi to the j, and then higher order terms. By this, I mean terms that uh, start probably there, there is some unit here or something like that. But the step from this guy, from this guy to the next one, to this one is given by Taylor's theorem, okay? So this condition about the order being greater than equals j means that or set this set star can be decomposed in the following way. This set is equivalent to having, let me put it here, guys. <clears throat> this set is exactly the same thing here, okay? This set is exactly given by this decomposition. So this is equivalent to have the uni a union of the following balls. This, those are balls, okay? In the periodic uh, case, those are balls. So uh, the center of these balls are this x0, satisfying this condition. x0 is a root mod pj. And then the radius of these balls are these guys. Okay, so I'm going to, to come back to this computation that I was making here. And let me see if I can write, I can write it in, a, in an interesting way. Okay, so. What I want to say is that uh, this set is uh, okay. No, sorry. Okay, this set uh, is is a very interesting set. So this is equivalent. Um, sorry, I, I, okay, okay, it's here. So this set is exactly equivalent to uh, counting the number of points in the following set. This is CP mod pi to the J CP and then f of x, let, let us put here x0, okay? So another way to say this, another way to, 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 to talk about this set or this set is this one, okay? uh this is this is making some noise okay yeah that one this this is okay so this set this is the set of congruences of f mod pi to the j okay or solutions of for a uh, polynomial function uh mod zero Okay, to this congruence much later. So this set is actually really interesting. This this let, let me call this this guy NJ. 
actually i'm going to call this this the name the the number of points in this set i'm going to call this nj or if you prefer this and j of f okay so this 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 set is interested is an interesting set in number theory so one classical problem in number theory for instance ask how does the sequence nj behaves i mean for instance for uh, big values of the parameter j is this function is this the is the is the is this sequence finite is this sequence uh, regular in some sense it is constant for it is constant for for some f can we can we determine at which point it becomes constant so this is like a typical problem in, in number theory. So usually one asks how regular, and I'm going to say what, what, I, what do I mean by regular, but uh, for instance, one can ask how does this sequence depends on, on P also. So let us, let us make, let us compute some samples. I have uh, a question. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So my question is: Can it happen that any and J is infinity, or or all of them are finite? Well, you are looking for solutions in a finite set. I mean, because this is this is uh, yeah, the, the, that is a good point. This is equivalent. Actually, this is this set equals to C. It is an isomorphism of this set with this set. Okay. So this is this is a finite set. I mean. So for this, the, 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 the possibilities here are finite, okay? Yeah, thank you, it's, it's clear. Okay. Yeah, okay, so let us, let us take some, some examples of this, of this uh, sequence. For instance, if you consider y minus x squared, because for those of you that know some uh, calculus, you remember that is this is something like this. Uh, you can compute actually uh, very easily that, uh, well, answer, this is by definition, I mean, this is the, the, <laughs> the simple one, but you can, you can compute that the, when p equals one, Uh, when j is equals to one, this means that j equals one here, here, and here. When p equals one, you have exactly p solutions, okay? When uh, p equals two, you have exactly p square solution, and so on. When you have uh, p to the k, you have exactly p to the k solutions, okay? So this sequence is actually yeah. really nice, okay? So we have a, a very, very beautiful behavior. Let's see what happens with, with this guy. Uh, this is a guy in two variables, and this is something like this, like this, okay? So the, the first guy is free, is for free. 
is by definition. Uh, for the second one, we have, uh, or for n equals one, for j equals one, we have two p minus one, and three p squared minus two p. So those one guess what will be the value of this in k? Okay. I plus one p to the yeah. k minus k p. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in this case, this is also a nice sequence, and you can describe exactly what is what is the the, the term corresponding to the to the k. So. But the, the, this is a, a, a not so nice like this one, okay? Okay, let's continue. So this is this is another example. This is a, what is called a cosp singularity, something like this. Okay. So when you make the the, the computations, you can you can see that there, there is some regularity in the first guys. For the third one you see another behavior and there is a block of three guys with an, another behavior. And then we switch to another block. And then we go to another block that is more or less like uh, this one, like the second one. There's also another block that is uh, in some ways similar to this one. But then there is there there appears some other block that is more or less related with these those ones. But now is not so well behaved, right? I mean, you can you can do it this by yourself. It's, it's not it's not difficult. Maybe with the help of a, a computer, you you can can compute these numbers. Okay. Uh, but what I want to, 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 to point out is that the behavior of this sequence is of this sequence in, in this case is not so nice. So what does have changed from this scenario to this one and then to this one? What does it make that the behavior changes in, in, in such a radical way? So the answer is that uh, there are there are no singularities here. There are just one singularity here, and one easy singularity, and there is a not so easy singularity. So what we are going to 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 show during during the course, what I want to explain is that the singularity of the function that you are considering determines not just the behavior of the of this succession of this sequence sorry but also the behavior of the local city function okay as an exercise you may compute uh, this is this is another paradigmatic example because in this case uh, NJ is not so nice. And actually you have several uh, cases depending on congruences of P, uh, of the class of the congruence of P mod one or three, okay? So you can do this as an example. Uh, so as I was saying, if we have a, no singular points, for instance, actually we, we can use Hensel's lemma I don't remember if uh, Vladimir Anashin's deal with this this guy uh, with this Hensel lemma. He, if he states this Hensel lemma, but anyway, you can find it elsewhere. So you can use the Hensel lemma to prove that there is a simple for a simple, uh, simple and compact way of write the succession, this is my NJ, okay? This is NJ. So the point is that this sequence changes 
drastically when F has singularities. But anyway, uh, Borevich and Chafarevich, they conjecture that this sequence is a regular sequence. Uh, oh, sorry, it's, it should be, it shouldn't be regular. Oh, sorry, should be, shouldn't be regular. Shouldn't be a recurrent. A recurrent sequence. What do I mean by a recurrent sequence? That behaves in some way like the Fibonacci sequence. Okay, it is enough to know one few terms or I don't know a, a few terms uh, in order to know the whole behavior of the sequence. So one classical approach to this type of problems, this was conjectured by Borovich and Chafarevich in the, their book about number theory. Uh, so one, one classical approach to this type of problems when we want to show that uh, a sequence is a recurring one, is to attach to this uh, sequence a Poincaré series, okay? So what is a Poincaré series? This is by definition, something like this. Here T is a complex variable with number less than one, okay? So there is a theorem that says that this sequence is recurrent, is a recurrent one if and only if its Poincaré series is a rational function. So if you can write this as a rational function of T, then this is equivalent to show that this sequence admits like a linear recurrence. Okay, so how does this story relate is related with with local city functions? Let me take let me go back to this to this definition. So remember this writing that we have here. We put it here the thing that we call uh in j right so okay let me let me do this ah okay yeah i, I got it here sorry we have that uh for our previous writing we have that or local city function equals to uh, pi to the minus j, j s, and then we have here the n, n j, and then we have the second uh, the second set that we would we were we were take it out right. So this is equivalent to the following to the following writing. We have here the first term. And then we just make some some uh, reorder, rearranging the, the the things, and then what we do is like uh, we take t as pi to the minus s. So by taking this this uh, by taking this by making this this uh, 
assignment, what we have is uh, that this first term is exactly the Poincaré series. And here, what we have is the Poincaré series, but with a shift, right? So in order to, to adjust this, we can't, we can't take this like to be one, and then for that reason, this one here appear, okay? So at the end, what I want to say is that the Poincaré series can be written as, uh, as this rational function where the local theta function appears. So if we want to know if all uh, sequence in J is a recurring one, we have to show that the Poincaré series is a rational function. But showing that the Russian that the Poincaré series is a rational function is equivalent to showing that the this local series function is a rational function. Okay. So Igusa has this theory for every change of every conjecture is true. Because this is a rational function of pi to the minus s. So this is something that I hope to, to prove on, in the next session. But uh, for the time being, I'm going to continue with uh, the theory of local set of functions, okay? So this def or definition of the local set function was just using the absolute value of the norm, uh, of the, the, the periodic norm, sorry, of the polynomial f, but you can you can decorate this 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 definition of the local city function in several ways. One way to do that is to put another uh, function. So you can use a locally constant city function. This is this is uh, a locally constant function with compact support. This is what Wilson called today test functions. Okay, this is a, a test function. So if you use a, a test function, it, remember that the test functions are defined over QP. So you can integrate now over QP to the N. And then this, is, this gives a generalization of the, of the previous uh, local seat function, okay? And moreover, you can, you can also add to these things, a character, okay? So you can add here a character, apply, you can re, you may replace this by the character of the angular component of f to the x, okay? And this is where, where, where chi is an additive character, okay? And this, this, in this, in this way, these integrals are called twisted, twisted local theta functions. So th th there is a whole family of local theta functions based on the on the same on the same structure. Uh, okay, so, okay, we have here that there is a remark about the convergence. The convergence of, of the integral is guaranteed by the, the fact that uh, we are taking here a function with compact support. I, I hope this, this is clear. Okay. Okay. Uh, the rationality statement is also true in this generality, even in the generality with, with uh, characters, okay? Okay, so uh, hopefully we want to convince ourselves of the rationality of the local seat function. I mean, <laughs> this is something that I, I, I've been talking about, but uh, we don't have so many examples at hand so 
because okay you know for instance this relationship and you may try to compute local CETA functions uh, for instance for these examples about the NGAs right so you can do it you can do you can do that you can compute you can use this relationship you can do, use this equation as an exercise you may use this this relationship in order to compute uh, local theta functions the local theta functions of uh, some uh, very simple examples that we already consider. But we want to have uh, more evidence to convince ourselves that uh, this, this, this is true. Because, okay, well, the only, it's not the only one, but the, the example that I, I was thinking about in, in this, when I wrote these, these notes are like the, this integral is one minus pi to the minus one, one minus pi minus one minus s, okay? So this is was, this was like a, the example that we begin with. Uh, and I promise to compute uh, some examples for for the cusp singularity and hopefully for more things. So one one strategy that we can use to compute uh, this this these integrals because you know th those are like regular integrals because the 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 arguments are periodic numbers so you can use like a change of variables formula you can use like a simple uh, or or more complicated stuff related with change of variables you even use like a, the jacobian and so on uh, but maybe for instance it, it is not clear how to perform a change of variables here in order to compute or to simplify this integral or to to arrive from this integral to something like uh, these ones i mean not it's not so easy at uh, the first sight okay so we have something that was uh, discovered, let's say, by Igusa, that is called stationary phase formula, okay? So in order to, to explain stationary phase formula, let me... Let me see my notes. Okay. So the first thing that I want to, to, to use is um, what is called the reduction mod P map. This is a map that it is usually denoted by like, uh, something like this. And this is a map that comes in this way. If you take uh, a periodic number, written, writing it this way, a periodic integer actually, is x1, x2, plus or, and so on. What you have to do to take in the reduction mod p is to kill the things that have p, okay? So this is just x here. In this case, I'm assuming that this is exactly the set of, so I'm identifying this uh, finite field 
with this set, okay? So this is the reduction mode pmap, and this can be extended in a, in a naive way uh, to several dimensions, okay? Okay, so I want to 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 stay this this um, stationary phase formula, but uh, we are using we are getting used to to the to the breaks between talks. So let's take a break of ten minutes, and we'll continue in at exactly four p.m. Right? Okay. Okay. So, are, are, if if you have any questions or, or comment, and that is also okay. Pela <laughs> Ah, eso es lo que 
Sí, porque el rubio se justifica en general y creo que no es fácil ver eso. Las fotos que es más bonito, sí. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, shall we continue? So uh, this stationary phase formula uh, is a tool to compute local seed functions. So it works in, in this way. We are going to, to take a set, we are going to use this reduction mode P map. That is uh, something that comes from CP and to FP to the power n. So we will consider uh, something here, um, some set here will be sent by this map in bar in this class, like, uh, uh, like in a naive way, okay? Uh, but, uh, this 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 letter E will denote like a, a, any any subset subset of CPN, but then I can take also uh, a, a special set that I'm going to compute here. This set is called S bar, and S bar will be the set of singular points of. This is the set of singular points. of f bar by f bar i mean um the reduction mode the the, the polynomial function that uh results from the taking the reduction the mod p reduction of a, every coefficient of of the function f. okay so um what is a singular point what is my definition of a singular point of f bar so is a point that satisfies exactly this equation, okay? So it's a point that is a C of F bar and is also a zero of every partial derivative of F for any I, okay? Uh, I mean zero uh, mod P, okay? This this zero map. So this is the set of singular points here, and this set of singular points, this set of singular points, it corresponds a set S here in CP. Okay. So the thing is that uh, when we want to compute or integral over 
or where does it e in cp what we have to do is to look for uh, these three guys so the heuristic says that this first term comes from the non-zeros or let's say no roots or no roots of f bar. The second term comes from the non-singular roots of the function f bar. And the last thing comes from the singular from the singular roots. Okay. So this formula says that uh, we can compute these guys and the contribution of the no roots is something that uh, doesn't involve p to the minus s, this term. The contribution of the non-singular roots is something that involves in a very specific way, uh, the power of a, a p to the, pi to the minus s, so appears here and here. And there is also something that uh, we cannot compute. Okay, so something that depends on the singular points of, of the function f bar. So how does, uh, how does one prove this? The thing is uh, that we are going to use a very simple, a very simple uh, trick. The thing is to use the following uh, writing for A. A can be written as the set of uh, balls. Remember that those are pairy balls of radius one, because this is the power that we are taking here. And centered by the center of these balls, we are taking uh, the reduction mod P of A, okay? That is something that is in the, in the first expansion of, the, of A, okay? It's the first digit in the periodic expansion of A. So this is, this is a, very, a very naive, uh, a very naive uh, writing of this set in, in, this, in terms of these balls. So my zeta function define it over this set E becomes a finite sum of these guys here, okay? But this is equal to uh, the following change of variables because we are we what we have here is that x belongs to this set to this ball, so we can change the variables, and when we, when we do this, what we get is pi to the minus n, and then uh, we have here inside the the polynomial function, we have a plus pi x, right? And our integral over CPA. So again, what we have to we have to do is to let me see. Okay. I'm going to write this the same guy. Yes. This is the same integral. I mean, 
This is just the same integral, but we are we are splitting the set of the, the first sum, okay? This is what what we are doing here, okay? So this is exactly the same guy that comes here with the integral and with even when the integral, okay? So the step from this line to this one, what we are doing is just splitting the set of uh, where we are taking the a bar, okay, this set. Okay, so, um, so for, uh, for the first set, for this one, I'm going to assume just, uh, I'm going to put just another condition over the set of definition of the sum, okay, of the sum. So I'm going to, split the first set in these two sets. There are sets where f bar is different from, from if r evaluated that in a bar is, is not congruent with zero mod p and the set uh, at the complement, okay? And then we have the same integral here and the same integral here, okay? And for the other one, For this one, we do nothing, okay? So this is the same right here. So the first case, in the first case, we are analyzing this set. So what happens in this case? What happens when with the PID absolute value of F evaluated in a plus px. So remember that we already used this trick before. So by using the Taylor expansion theorem, we may conclude that this is equals actually to f evaluated in a plus p, and then we have higher order terms, right? But f, evaluated in A is actually equal to F bar evaluated in A, a bar, okay? So this is exactly, uh, this, this is an equality. And then this, this second part of the hypothesis says that this is not congruent with zero mod P, mod P right? So this means that the norm of the guy is one because of the ultramatic property, okay? So this is one, and then uh, the, the whole integral is just the measure of Cn. So the measure of Cn is one. So what we have here is one. So the full count for this, for this whole term is just pi to the minus n, and then the number of points in A bar satisfying this condition. And this is exactly the number of points in A bar, A bar minus the number of roots of the function f. Right? So this is the first term. So we continue with the next one. For the next one, I'm going to use another core. Uh, let me use this. Okay, for this one, we have this property. We have that this is a, a zero mod p, but is not, but, it, it it's also satisfies this a bar satisfies this property. This should be not congruent with zero mod p for some i because otherwise it will be a singular point, right? So it's not one of these guys. 
So one of these is not congruent with zero mod p. So I'm going to assume that the, the index is one, and then I'm going to use the following change of variables. So I'm going to use to define, sorry, I'm going to, to take pi i as f of a plus px minus f of x over p if i equals one and otherwise uh, x i, okay? So we need to compute this integral. And for this integral, we change variables. So this integral becomes just this one, okay? It is clear what we are doing here. So remember, here we have a, a, an integral that is that is where where the domain is CPN, okay, right? And then I have these all these conditions, and with these conditions, with this this condition and this one, this condition, I make this change of variables. This change of variables says that uh, there is just one variable that plays a main role. The other ones, they, they didn't appear here, okay? So my change of variables formula says that this integral is actually equal to this integral over CP, just CP, right? Because uh, I'm also applying Fibini's theorem, right? And the and the and the measure of the other integrals are just are just one. Okay. Okay. So now I have to compute this integral, but uh, computing this integral is really simple. Uh, I just I'm just uh, factorize p, take p out of the absolute value, so it's pi to the minus s appears here, and then what we have here. Uh, can be can be transformed can be can be can be put in in this way by using a linear change of variables. Okay, and this last integral is a very well known guy, or I hope so. <laughs> that at, at this point, this is this is a well known guy. So at the end, what we get is the this integral is actually equals to pi to the minus s times the local city function of the simple monomial. okay? So this is exactly the contribution that we were waiting for in this formula. Okay, so this is pi to the minus n minus s multiplied by this. Uh, oh yeah, sorry because I I, I I didn't I didn't count the I didn't make this this last count because the number of guys. Okay, yeah, here here is the full the full so, so sorry. Uh, so uh, the thing is that we are we were taking pi to the minus n, and then we multiply by this integral, by the integral appearing here. So the result of this integral is this, and then we need to count the number of points in this, in this set, okay? I don't know if you remember this because now this is a mess. Oof. Now this is a mess and then I can not do anything about that. But uh, we have here pi to the minus n and then one set here and then another as a second set here. The contribution for this set is clear. The contribution for the, for the set in green is given by this integral. And we are left with the number we are counting the number of points in this 
in this uh, green set. And the number of points in this green set is the number of roots of n minus the number of singular points, okay? Okay, well, so at the end, what we have is that uh, we were able to compute the contribution of the different parts of uh, this simple division of F in singular points and regular points, okay? So this is just a simple idea, but this simple idea is, is, is very powerful and allow us to compute a lot of examples. So this is the thing that I promised at the beginning. We are going to compute the, the, the local city function of the cost singularity. So let us begin with this calculation. So in this case, we take in the integral over CP squared. So a, a bar is FP squared also. And how about the singular points of F bar? First, know that F bar is exactly F, right? Because there is nothing to, to mod out, okay? To cancel mod P. So S, uh, S bar is just one point. So there is just one singular point and the singular point is zero, zero, right? So you compute the partial derivatives and what you get is that the only singular point is the origin. So this is also a consequence of this, this stupid drawing. Um, okay. So what is what is the lifting of this S bar? So this corresponds to this set, right? Because remember that the mod P uh, map just corresponds to taking the first part in the periodic expansion, okay, of these guys. So if the singular point is zero, this means that uh, there is no, there is no unit in the, in the periodic world, okay? Okay, anyway, so I need to compute these guys, E as far, and then, N is the number of points of, of this, this, this congruence mod P. We already saw this in one of the calculations that we made uh, about the, the, the sequence NJ, but it, it is not difficult to show that this guy is exactly P, okay? You may use also a parametrization because this, this function, this curve, can be parametrized very easily, okay? That's t squared. t cubed, t squared, okay. So what does the stationary phase formula says is that uh, we need to compute, we need to put here pi to the minus pi, uh, p to the minus n, in this case, p to the minus two. And then the number of points in f p square, this is p square. Then the number of non-roots of, sorry, of roots of, of, of this guy, 
this p and then we have the following contribution for the for the non singular roots pi to the minus n minus s and then the the zeta function of the monomial right this is the zeta function of the monomial and then you multiply by the number of points uh, of zeros of the function that are not uh, singular, but the only singular point is zero zero, so we have just one singular point. So you can write this, and then what we have here is uh, that we are doing the integral over this set, right? So pi s dx dy. Okay. So the first two terms, I'm not I'm going to deal with this. This is this is okay. But for this integral, I want to compute, I want to make a change of variables. Uh, and the change of variables is to make x equals to pi x and y equals to py, right? I keep saying pi, but but I do, I don't. <laughs> but it's, it's it's p, okay. Um, so in this, uh, what, when we do this, uh, what we get is that um, here we have p squared, pi squared, p squared, and we have here um, in here we have p, we have p squared and here we have p cube okay so we take the uh, lower common guy and there is that is p squared to the power s and then we use this is pi to the minus 2 s so let me put it this way there so this is pi to the minus two minus two s, and this the, this this minus two comes from the change of variable formula. Okay, and then we get the integral over CP of this function x squared minus p y cube. Right. Okay, so now what? Now we have to compute the integral for this guy. So we make another, we repeat the, the procedure and take as g x squared minus pi y cube. Now that in this case, G bar equals s x squared. Okay, so this implies that the <coughs> that the singular points of this are zero in the variable x and then nothing. Okay. nothing for the variable y. So this means that uh, in the variable x we have this, and in the variable y we have nothing, okay? And we may count the number of points uh, of x squared equals zero, and this will be exactly p, okay? So we apply again the formula, the formula says, uh, that this is pi to the minus two pi square minus pi plus p to the minus one minus s the integral because th there is no contribution for the non singular roots okay because every every root is is this a singular point okay is a, a singular one
So again, we use a change of variables like this one, okay? And we get, what we get here is something like, uh, this is pi to the minus one minus s, and then the integral over CP square of what? Because in this case, just the, the x variable uh, was, having a, a, a P in front of it, okay? So there is, there is a P squared here and this P factorizes just one, just once and you get P, let me write U variable plus big U, okay? Okay. So again, we can apply in order to compute this integral, we can apply uh, the same, we can apply the same method and not going to do all the calculations this time because you are getting bored, so, so do I. So this is just uh, something like this. Okay, let me show you. For this guy, the contribution is just pi to the minus. Okay, and now what about this guy? What about this guy? That is the guy that we get uh, when apply this, this stationary phase formula once more time. So for this guy, we made an, another application, an extra application of the stationary phase formula. And what we get is the same function that we begin with. Okay. So after a long calculation, we can see that uh, our original theta function has this, this term plus pi to the minus two minus two s and then the theta function of G, something that I call G but this induces another application of the stationary phase formula and so on and so on. So at the end, what we have is like, uh, these guys are annihilated in this way. So we can show after a long computation or a short one, I mean, it depends on your patience, um, that the whole thing, gets this result. So what is what is the what is the, the special thing about this? So first, this is a tool to compute local city functions. Okay, so there is a tool to compute local city functions and this tool pro produces um, produces a, a rational function. So this is, this is important because one of the conjectures is that this uh, is, is, was a rational function, okay? This is one of the theorems. So um, I'm going to, to do this really, really, really quick because 
because we have all the other things to say. Um, so as you can see, as you can note in the whole computation of this, this, this whole procedure works in the following way. So we start with a function and then making one, two, three, four applications, we get at this at the end, we get the same guy. So because we have the same guy, we are able to clear these denominators and numerators and so on. And what we get at the end is a rational function of pi to the minus s, right? So is this process can be can be so one question is can we do this always can we obtain every time that i'm using the section of the phase formula we will have something like this like that the original function appears here and then after a number of successive applications of the section of the phase formula can we obtain the same function here? We don't know, in general. But there are some cases when this is, this is, this is true, and this is really easy, okay? So uh, for this, this, this really simple example in three variables, um, is, I'm going to do this very quick because we have some experience with this already so you can compute the singular points of this guy and the only singular point that you will find is the origin in three variables okay so this means that uh, cp this set of singular points is p cp to the power uh, three and for n i don't know if i okay you can compute, this is an exercise. You may compute that the number of uh, roots of this polynomial in three variables is exactly pi squared, p squared. So in this case, we write the contribution, the formula, And then note that the next thing that we have to do is a change of variables, right? But the change of variables will be like P, X, P, Y, and P, C, right? And this will imply that this thing becomes pi to the minus three, minus three, and minus six s, sorry, minus two s. And then you obtain the same guy, the same function that we started with, okay? So this, just this integral is is this is this is this calculation. So by making the same trick and passing and clearing denominators and so on, we can obtain a formula for 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 the local C function. So what is special about that guy? The special about that guy is that uh, those guys are called are part of a family of functions, of polynomial functions. So 
if we have a, an homogeneous function of degree d, what, what does it mean? It means that when you consider f t x1 t x n, you get t to the power d f x1 x n. When you have something like this, you will call your, your function homogeneous, okay? In this case, our function was homogeneous of degree two. Okay. So when you have an homogeneous function and the origin is the only, is the only uh, singular point, this is, this is like a, a very fancy terminology for that but it is it just saying that the origin is the only point that uh, appears uh, like a singular point then the local seat function cf has, has a closed form okay and the procedure is exactly the same it's just you just write the stationary phase formula and we get in the first application what you get is the this is exactly the guide that we started with. So I'm not going to, to bore you with, with, with the details, uh, but if you want to see the proof of this, of, this, um, of this statement, please take a look at our, our notes, okay? Because this is, this is proving in detail. But you can also do it yourself, I mean, this is this is really easy with the with the formula with the stationary phase formula at hand okay so using this stationary phase formula and the conditions about f you can conclude um, that this function hey has a closed form no okay okay so um <laughs> So the stationary phase formula um, is a formula to compute um, to compute local set of functions and works very well for um, functions for polynomial functions or or generally for for other functions. Uh, that have uh, like a regular behavior, okay? So in this case, know that this is this is uh, this is a really strong condition, okay? This this condition is is really strong. So if you can control the singularities of your function in some special way, then you may expect that the stationary phase formula gives you uh, something really, really nice, okay? So there are other classes of functions for which the stationary phase formula is very useful in order to compute the, the or in order to know the rationality of the local suite function, okay? Moreover, moreover, what we are doing here is having a um, is having a closed form because you're also computing you computing compute the numerator and the denominator of the local suite of functions. So one important thing that we want to know about local suite of functions is uh, what are the poles of the local suite of functions. So. The stationary phase formula gives you a procedure to check is if something that appears in the denominator appears also in the numerator. Okay, so it gives you actually the the poles of or the the poles of the local seat of function. So this is this is really nice, but this is limited to um, some uh, to some classes of of functions. So, so in general, it's not true 
or at least is, it is not known that successive applications of the stationary phase formula would give a proof of the rationality of the local function. Okay, so there are classes, ample, there are classes that are really big, classes of functions where this procedure of the of the stationary phase formula gives, gives something. In some of these cases, you can also know the numerator and the denominator of the local theta functions. In some other cases, there, there's just one algorithm, algorithm that says that um, there is an explicit description of the, uh, of the, of the denominator of the local theta function. But here, what we only have is some function, some polynomial function of pi to the minus s, of p to the minus s, okay? So there are some algorithms doing this for some time, types of uh, functions in several variables. So it was a conjecture that uh, the stationary phase formula would give another proof of the rationality of the local state function. But this is an, an open problem, okay? <clears throat> so the second comment that I want to, to make about this, this formula is the following one. Um, there, is, there is some other object of non-Archimedean nature that is very, very, very alike like with, with the periodics. So uh, the Loran, the, the field of formal Loran series is the, is the field of elements of this form. So we have a Loran series. This means that uh, this, this is a power series starting in possibly a, a, negative, a negative index and then going to infinity. But the coefficients of these guys are, belongs to a finite field, okay? So the, 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 this, this is actually a field and the structure of this field is very, is, is analog to the structure of QP, okay? So what do I mean by this? I mean, there is also a topology that is given by balls that may define, can be defined in exactly the same way. We, we, we may get uh, analogs of CP here and analogs of the, of the other balls, IJCP describe it in exactly the same way. So it is possible to define local city functions for these guys. What, are the, what is the main difference? The main difference with QP is that this Laurent formal, this, this series of, of Laurent, a, they have characteristic P. So, we will see tomorrow in our lectures that uh, the proof that Vigusa gives, the first proof that Vigusa gives about uh, the rationality of the local theta function, because I, I, I am saying here that this is another proof, okay? But the proof that we will see tomorrow the proof of the rationality of the local state function over QP is based on resolution of singularities. This is a, a, a very important result in algebraic geometry. And it is not known so far uh, if there is a resolution of singularities in positive characteristic. So 
is this uh, on the light of this 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 proof we cannot use that result in order to conclude if the local city functions defined over the formal Lorentz series are rational or not. So there is a conjecture, say, that the local set of functions define it over these guys as rational functions, okay? How does one conjecture something like that? Because the stationary phase formula, oh, sorry, because the stationary phase formula works also well on these guys okay you just need to replace what is what is needed I, instead of writing instead of writing cp you write the local ring of of this this power series and so on so you replace the things that, that that you need to replace and the stationary phase formula works well so this gives some evidence that uh, the local set of functions, they should have the same properties that in the PID case. But we don't know if this conjecture is true in general because we don't have, the only tool that we have at hand uh, is resolution of singularities, okay? And we will deal with that in the, in the next lecture. Okay, so, so are there any questions or comments? There is a question here in the room. There is a question. Yeah. Uh, my question is, is there um, a more general frame for Ibusa local uh, theta function? For example, by changing the, the group? Um, which group? Uh, using other locally compact groups instead of uh, QP. yeah but the 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 thing is that uh, the models of the, the there is a classification of the local local fields and the classification says that you have qp or fp of t uh, this is the, the one of uh, characteristic zero. This is the one of characteristic P. And then you, you may have also finite extensions of these guys. So essentially, uh, this covers all the known cases of uh, local fields. But I don't know if it's this is what what you what you mean, but um, there are other generalizations of the local city functions, and I'm going to discuss this maybe in the next lecture. And the more general object is called a motivic city function. Okay, this is some object that is defined using uh, tools from algebraic geometry. And um, this motivic set of functions specializes to uh, the periodic set of function. So in some sense, this is like a more general 
like a more general version of this one. Uh -huh. oh, I, I want to ask uh, previously there is a conjecture by Tavaregish. Uh, the sequence MJ is a recurrent sequence. Uh -huh. Can you say what is a recurrent sequence? Oh, yeah. It's. it's, it's... It's uh, a, a sequence like uh, the Fibonacci sequence, you know, that you, know, you need to know what is the first term. So uh, I don't, I hope not to is F1 is one. And then for the other guys, you just make F1 plus, uh, I don't remember exactly how this fi is equals to fi minus one. It should be something like this. fi minus two. fi minus two. Uh, instead of f zero. Uh-huh. And the first term, i minus one in the subscript. There, 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 there. Here? Yes. Okay. okay. I minus one and then I minus two. Okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so this the sum of the previous guys. Okay. You know, this is this is one way to define the, the Fibonacci sequence. So this is this is like a this is what, what I mean by, by the recurrence, okay? So it, it is enough to know just few terms in this way. In this case, you just need to know the, just the first two terms in order to know all the sequence, right? So you might generalize this 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 example, including more more terms here. Maybe maybe it is enough to to know the first the the first I don't know one hundred terms, and then you can say that in general your nj will be something related a function a linear function of these 101 terms, okay? And so, is there any relation between the number of previous terms that you need and the degree of the polynomial? So uh, again, um, are you saying, for instance, if the expression for nj is related with the degree of the polynomial? And, um, the number of previous terms that you need. So this one the hundred. This one hundred here. Yes. Uh, I don't remember exactly. I don't remember how many terms do you do you need. So I mean, the the theorem says that if your uh, Poincaré series is a rational function. Then there is a there is a recurrence, but I'm not sure if you can recover which is the the the, the linear function, and if you can bound this the number of terms that you need. Uh, I don't remember exactly. Sorry, sorry about that. I don't know if Wilson knows. Maybe maybe he. He's aware of this. I was asking a, a, a relation between the, the number of terms needed in the linear reference and the degree of the polynomial F. Yeah, this is unknown. It's unknown. Yeah. This is there is a, it is possible to establish a connection between 
the, denomin the denominator of the Poincaré series yeah. and the number of terms yeah. that you are asking. This is yeah, that's true. That's true. Now the connection yeah. with the polynomial F is, is unknown. Yeah, yeah. What is known is probably easier. Yeah, but that, that, that is true. If you know uh, explicit expression for this, then you may recover the whole sequence, the whole recurrence sequence. Okay, any other question? Okay, uh, so I think there, there are no more questions. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much for your, for your talk. Okay, thank you guys. Okay, so um, uh, the yesterday's uh, talk by, so the talk by, by Professor Shamsedin uh, has been rescheduled to uh, next Tuesday at one. Okay. One or one theory. Okay. And uh, now uh, we're gonna have take the, the, the conference picture. Uh, so I think somebody's gonna come here to, to to lead us to the place where we're gonna take the picture. So please don't uh, okay. don't go away. Just be be patient. Thank you. And and uh, and uh, we come back at uh, five thirty for 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 lecture by Dr.
Entonces esto me lo pongo lo más abajo posible, me imagino. Demasiado tarde. Sí, ¿verdad? Se ven un poquito raros. Es que no es negro. Es que no es negro, es este... Es gris, pero sí. Pero se me hace que es por la resolución. Porque en mi computadora se ve bien. Pero sí, debí de haber probado el color. A lo mejor lo puedo cambiar. No, no, no cambie nada, porque el color se Tienes toda la razón, no voy a hacer. La ley de Morphy siempre funciona. Con... Ahora. Ah. Ah. Y posiblemente cerrarlo, ¿verdad? Con quince minutos.
Lo sé, lo sé. Una vez en que estábamos también en un evento y estaba ahí lo sé. Entonces yo estaba haciéndoles magias ahí a varios, ¿no? Y entonces me dijeron, a ver, que a los profesores eso hacerles ahí una magia. Entonces me le acerqué para hacerle la magia y me vio con una cara de total desprecio, así, lo sé. Y así como que... Sí, sí, sí. Y dije, ay, sí, francés, así sí, son. Sí, no, esos tipos son bien, pero bien complicados. Sí, no. Sí, ese es, y los otros.
Are you following me? Yeah. talk about static numbers and dynamical systems and morphogenesis. So this talk will be like a all public talk, I hope. So I was thinking in the students that maybe it's the first time that encounter static numbers. But also I would like to show something uh, which is very interesting, which is static dynamical systems or dynamical systems over static over finite scales and static dynamical systems and the relations they have some of the relations, and then an interesting application of this uh, of this uh, study of dynamical systems to biology, in particular to morphogenesis. 
Well, since every talk should start with a little story, and maybe you don't, you know the story, you know maybe very well the story of the chess, the invention of the chess game. So you don't know the story of the chess game. So the classical, the classical story of chess, chess game starts with a, they say a, an Indian guy maybe that invented the chessboard and the game. And then it presented to, to the king. So he presented the chessboard to the king and showed him how to play chess. So the king uh, was so happy uh, and so interested in the game that, that he decided to pay whatever he wants for, for the game. So he was really like, this is the best game in my life. And I will pay you whatever you want. So the story says that the, the inventor of the chess decided to ask for one grain of rice or whatever you, uh, corn or whatever, in the first square, two in the second square, four in the third square, and so on and so forth. So uh, the, the king was like, oh, it, it, can be, it can be true. This is just so few for me. You, you may I ask for your game, really, whatever you want. I have gold, I have uh, whatever you want. Ask for that. And the, and the guy was like, no, that's OK. Just give me what I ask. OK, if this is your choice. I take the chess. And that's it. The, the, the king was very loyal, so he asked uh, the people in the, in the kingdom to, to recover all the rice or all the grains and then to, to pay this guy. So uh, the mathematician of the court asked, wonder how many grains of rice do I have to pay? And then you know that you, you have 64 squares, so the classical sum of these numbers. But then uh, you know that this sum, if you realize all the operations, will be this number in red that I guess you cannot see very well because this is red. This is a, a big number times 10 to the power 19. So this is a huge number. But since we are mathematicians, we often don't have this notion of dimension, really how much is this. So just to, to wonder how much is it, you may wonder how is the production of grains of rice or whatever in the whole world. And if you make the, the count of the production of one year, this is 2017. If you do the addition and then you, you calculate the, the amount of years you need to produce in the whole world, this amount of rice will be 1,195 years. So, Obviously, the king couldn't pay this amount of money. So he was like, it is not possible. So he, could, he should give the kingdom away to, the, to this guy because he was loyal and then he decided. So the, the king was from one day to be rich, the, the other day was poor with just a chessboard in his hand and, and still with a debt to this guy because he couldn't pay. <laughs> in... Um, in a perfect world, things would be different. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> the story has a nice for the king end. As you may imagine now, you know already how periodic numbers work, right? So the mathematician in this alternative periodic kingdom came to the to the king and said at, at the last minute, "Wait, why don't you tell this guy?" to pay the same thing or the same method, but for an infinite chessboard. So a chessboard with an infinite amount of squares. So we are going to do the same. I'm going to pay you one grain for the first, two for the second, and so on and so forth. So now the amount of grains of, of uh, rice that we have to pay is the result of this addition, this infinite addition. And then now you know periodic numbers, so you know what is going to happen, right? So. Uh, if we factor two from the second, from the second uh, term, then we get the sum. And then once we get the sum, then we, can, we realize that this is the same as s is equal to 1 plus 2s. And if we solve the linear equation, we easily see that we have s equal to minus 1. So the amount of grains of rice that we have to give, the amount of grains that he, have, he has to give to the, to the guy's minus one grain. So in fact, he will keep the chessboard and one grain from the other, from the other guy. So, 
So of course, um, the Indian guy was like very surprised. What, what is going on? Usually, when I ask people what is happening with this, what what is wrong with this, mathematicians used to tell me that we have a problem because this series is not convergent, right? And they say you cannot do the addition because you cannot group like that because the series is convergent. But these mathematicians are not mathematicians in the periodic world. And then we are now in the periodic world, okay? So you, you may know what is going to happen, of course. So we have the periodic numbers. So uh, I know that you have heard a lot of periodic numbers in these two days, but saying one more time what periodic numbers are is not bad in order to fix ideas. And then the, the thing is that God give, give us the numbers, the natural numbers, and the rest, everything else, is work of a man. So what I mean by that is that it's, we know how to count, so we have natural numbers. This is a natural thing. Then from natural numbers to integers is very easy, and then from integers to rational numbers is like very natural thing. So, so what happened next? So what, what mathematicians did? So after, after these natural numbers, mathematicians start to try to measure to, to calculate distance, right? So they, they realized that rational numbers were not enough. And then they just define the real numbers and they start to work with the, the measures. And then they realize that we have a set of real numbers. And then once we have real numbers, they want to measure areas. And then they realize that they have to solve quadratic equations, cubic equations, polynomial equations. They realize the real numbers are not enough to solve Equations, polynomial equations. What we did, mathematicians, we create another object, which is the complex numbers in which we can solve all algebraic equations. Right. So we have this is a story, natural story. But since you've been here in these two days, you know that this is only a little part of the whole possibility that we have in the world. Right. Because, well. What I'm saying is that we, once we have real numbers and complex numbers, we can do all kind of mathematics that as undergraduate students, you know, like calculus analysis, differential equations, complex geometry, differential equations, systems, and a huge list of interesting mathematics that you can do. However, as I said, one of the uh, key points in the construction of the real numbers, as you may know, is that the real numbers are obtained from rational numbers by completion, right? We, complete, we, we are interested in conversions of sequences of the rational numbers, and then we get real numbers. But this is, as you see, you know that we have different absolute values. We have different ways to measure distance in rational numbers. And then, in fact, for every prime number, we have uh, different metrics or absolute values. And therefore, we can construct different periodic Fields. So we have the periodic integers and the periodic numbers, you know already. And once we have periodic numbers, which is the completion of the rationals using one of these periodic absolute values, we may wonder the same thing. Can we solve algebraic equations? And when the first thing that we do is calculate the algebraic closure of the ration of the periodic rational numbers. And the main difference from the real, oh well, um, yes. I mean, QP is complete because this is the completion of the rational numbers. Uh, once we calculate the algebraic closure of the, of the rational numbers, we get an algebraic closed field. However, it is not complete. Uh, when we calculate the algebraic closure of the rational numbers, we get the complex number, which is complete and algebraic closure, algebraic, algebraic closed. But this is not the case here. But we can now calculate the completion of the of the algebraic closure of the periodic numbers, and we get another nice field, which is the complex, the periodic complex numbers, and the periodic complex number turns to be an algebraic close and complete. So this is very similar. We we may think this is very similar to the complex numbers, and then therefore we can do an Archimedean analysis. We can do analysis in these kind of fields. We can do dynamical system in these kind of fields, periodic dynamical systems. And then we can study, study like uh, differential geometry objects. Also, we can do analytic geometry. And, but we have more things like uh, affinoid spaces, Tate rigid geometry, Berkovich 
Berkovich geometry and a whole world of geometry and algebraic geometry and different kinds of areas of mathematics. And then uh, also we realized that most of the applications that we have done so far are in the first, only in this line, following this line. So physicists, biologists, uh, all scientists, usually, if they do applications, they do in this world. It's just a um, few years, I, I may say a few years ago, that people start to look to these kind of fields in order to start to do some applications, mainly to physics, but now uh, people is also looking at the biology side. Since by mathematics is going inside biology in all these areas, then also periodic analysis and periodic methods may be applied to biology. And today I'm going to talk to some applications of dynamical systems and some application to this in this in this part. So just considering. Just consider that this may be done for every prime number. So the usual line that mathematicians follow is just one of the many possibilities. And then changing prime numbers, we have, we have different fields, non-isomorphic, non-algebraic isomorphic, and non-complete. I mean, they are not isomorphic even as, as uh, topological spaces or whatever. So they are really different. So for every P, we have a different world and then, why just to look at the at one branch of mathematics, we'd say. So when we, uh, we go back to this alternative ending, so you realize that we are, as the, the summation that we get there was a, a dyadic number, right? It's a two adic number, because you already know that the adic numbers have an expression of as a power series in, in the in the prime, so in this case it's two. And this uh, calculation perfectly works in, in periodic numbers, in two adic estimation. So you, you already know that periodic numbers or, come, or the rational numbers we can give a, 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 an absolute value related to every prime. And then you already know these properties, and then you know that it gives you a, a, an absolute value with an extra property, which is the ultrametric inequality. Okay, so from this, we derive certain facts that also people talk a little bit, but just a little bit of this, and I want to stress these facts because they are important because they change our intuition and therefore they change the way we do geometry in, in this kind, not, not only analysis, because so far we, you have been doing analysis a lot, but also geometry that changes, that changes the way we see things. So for instance, every triangle is a right, <laughs> it's not a right triangle, it's an isosceles <laughs> triangle. So uh, you look at it. Oh, it's an isosceles triangle, okay? So for instance, so any two balls, either they intersect or one is inside the other. So this is a... Uh, uh, not the intersect or one is inside the other. Ah, yes, okay. any, four, any two balls, either they intersect, no, they, do not. they do not intersect or one is inside the other. Okay, thank you very much. So this is my fault. Any point on a ball is the center of the ball. So do you imagine the geometry like that? So this is weird. So every ball is an open and close. It's open and close at the topological space with the metric induced by the absolute value. And then the sphere, like the usual sphere, like just the boundary, or like we usually think as the boundary of the, of the ball is also open and close. It's not the boundary, by the way, not the topological boundary, but and then the induced topology with these metric spaces are totally disconnected. Also make this, the topological space as a top, realized as a topological, totally disconnected topological space, which means that the connected component of every point is just a point, right? So, so imagine you want to do uh, geometry in these kinds of spaces. So um, if you know something about geometry or for instance, about algebraic geometry or Sheaves that you realize that this property is uh, not good in order to to, to construct sheets of functions or good functions or analytic functions in a topological space. We have a lot of functions, right? So we don't want that. Okay, so there are some properties, and then uh, the once we have this metric, then we can go to the completion, and then the 
rational periodic numbers is the completion with this metric, as you should, you should know. So the closed ball of radius one with center at the origin is a local ring called uh, the periodic interior. Local ring means that this is a ring with only one maximal idea. So I, I'm talking of this because I would like also to show the algebraic side of periodic numbers, not only the analytic side of it. You have an algebraic way to approach to, to periodic numbers also. So this is a thing, and you know that uh, every periodic number can be written in this form as a power series in the prime P. And uh, the maximal ideal is the ball with uh, radius one over P, so P, C, P. And then it turns out that the fraction field, so the, the, in, the periodic interiors is a, is a in te integral domain. So we can have the fraction field is QP, is the rational, and the rational numbers. And then we know that the quotient of if I divide the, the integers most, its maximal ideal is a field, and it does a finite field with p elements. And uh, an algebraic approach to periodic numbers will be with uh, inverse limits. So is the inverse limits of all these rings C mod P and C? And then C mod P and C uh, is the usual quotient ring of inter the interior, the interiors must be to the n, and then the projected limit is just a subset of the product of all this ring, and is the sub subset of sequences of compatible sequences. By compatible, we mean that they are congruent uh, in consecutive uh, terms, must be to the power. And then from this algebraic construction, you may realize that these are groups. And then they are topological groups because we can give the, the discrete topology. So this is a topological group. The product of topological groups is a topological group. Since these are compact, since they are discrete, you, have, you also get the, that the product is compact by Tikhon theorem. And then you get, you get a subset of this, uh, of this, which is closed. You can prove this is closed, therefore it is compact. So you have another proof of this a topological group, which is compact. Also, and then uh, you have, uh, in principle, a different topology. Well, because this topology that I'm that I'm giving to CP is coming from the discrete topology of this of these topological groups and the product. And then, good news is that this topology is exactly the same as the topology that you get uh, studying the, the valuation or the the absolute value. It's exactly the same topology. Oh, this is a nice exercise. Is that a group, a group that so, is that a group topology? Is the group the topology exactly? So the, you realize CP as a profinite group. This is the group topology. So sometimes it's a good idea to have something in mind when we think about padding numbers. Uh, if you if you like or you like geometry or you want to do geometry, it's also. A good idea to have pictures. You cannot embed the periodic numbers in the real numbers, not as a topological field. But of course, you can do some uh, drawings, say, of the periodic. So the most, maybe the most common is to put the periodic numbers as a three. So you get the three, and then this is a, a drawing of the tuatic numbers or the diadic numbers, in which. Um, for instance, if you have the power expansion of the periodic numbers, then the coefficients are reflected in the direction you are taking uh, from any branch. So you see that in every point you have two possibilities, which may, may be written with C11, then you move around U3, and then you get this periodic number. This is in fact the whole, this is the periodic integers or two periodic integers. And then you see that in every point you have exactly the same structure. So Wilson tells you that this is a fractal. Now you can see that this is a fractal in a different way. But this is not the only way to draw periodic numbers. For instance, we have a drawing of, of three adic numbers with p equal to three in, in this circle. And then in here you see that the unit ball is formed by the, is the disjoint union of three other balls, and each one of these balls is the disjoint union of other balls. And then th this is the similar way. It depends how you move in the paddocks or in the centers of the balls. So Wilson told, tells you something like uh, if you truncate the power series, you are getting centers of balls which are inside and inside. So this is 
Another another drawing of the same thing, trying to imitate this is these three triadic numbers. And the last picture is like the second one with P equal to seven. So you see, we have these nice images. But as I told you, I would like to study dynamical systems. And then in particular, we want to study dynamical systems in the field other than the real numbers and on the complex numbers, not because real numbers or complex numbers are not important, but just because this is only one little part of all the whole story of mathematics that we can do. So we want, we'd like to study dynamical systems in other fields. In particular, we would like to study dynamical system over the periodic numbers or over any non-Archimedean field and over finite fields also, why not, right? So, and then we would like to understand the relations between dynamical systems say over the periodic numbers. And since periodic numbers are uh, very close related to finite fields, as you may see, like they are the, we, we obtained by a quotient of the think of integers, there's no via, there's most via relation between the dynamical systems over finite fields and dynamical systems over periodic fields, for instance. So we would like to understand this. And of course, uh, we would like to see if there are applications uh, to this point of view of mathematics, in particular to biology or physics. Okay, so let's start with some finite dynamical systems. What, what I mean by a finite dynamical system is just a pair, gamma, A phi, in which A is, a, is an empty set, and phi is just a function from A to I. And usually, once we have that, what we want to understand is like the uh, iterates of this function. We say that the dynamical spin system is finite if the set in which we are doing the dynamics is finite. And then uh, we would like to understand the, the iterates of the function. So for instance, we, we take an element A in the, in the set and we can look at the iterates of the function evaluated in this point. So phi to the n is just the composition of phi with itself n times. And this is the orbit, right? And then we may wonder all kinds of things like, uh, where is it going? So understanding the orbits of points is like understanding how the dynamical system develops, right? So where it goes. But then um, if I have a point, uh, certain classical definitions, if I have a point, a K periodic point is a point such that after K iterations, I return to the same point. So it forms a cycle, say. Uh, for some k, so the set of k periodic points is just the set of k periodic points. Then we have, uh, we say that a point is periodic if this is k periodic for some k, natural number k, and then we can consider also the set of all periodic points. And then uh, uh, we call the period of, a, of a, an element as the smaller number k such that a is k periodic, if it, it exists, of course. Okay, uh, the fixed points of the dynamical system, the stationary points are just the one periodic points, which is just the set of elements such that the polynomial fixes this point. Okay, so that, that's the thing. And then for, for every discrete dynamical system, we can associate a graph, and sometimes it's better or it's nicer to understand the dynamical system in terms of this direct graph, or direct graph because at least like, this gives us a geometric interpretation of the discrete system. And then how we construct this graph. Uh, so the graph we call also gamma, because really the same dynamical system in the graph, in which uh, the vertex of the graph are, is just the set A, and the edges, we're, we're drawing an edge between two points if a is connected with Y if Y is the image of A under the polynomial, under the function that we are defined. So this is just this. So you imagine how it is. I'm going to see to show an example. But just uh, for definitions, we call this dynamical system a tree if we don't have uh, cycles or the only cycles of the cycles of period one or, or the only, the only uh, period points or the fixed points. So in other words, okay. So just to illustrate, okay. At the end, so we say that gamma is a forest. If it, as a graph, we can look at the connected components of the graph. And then if each graph is a tree, 
then this is a forest. So you know that trees uh, are disconnected. So, so that's it. Okay, so this is an example. So we look at the function from the finite set, which is F11, so the finite field with 11 elements, and we just look at the function which is rising to the power 2x, going to the 2x squared. And if we do this graph, we get this picture, and then from this picture, we can illustrate all the definitions that we get. For example, we see that all points are pre periodic, which means that eventually they are going to be periodic, because this is a finite set, right? And then the periodic points are 0, 1, 3, 4, 5, 9. You see that 0, for instance, is a periodic point, it's a fixed point, and 1 is another fixed point, and you can easily check this. Then the fixed points are only 0 and 1. This is the only one periodic one periodic point. The three, three is a four periodic point, so you see in the picture. And then you see that the orbit of 7, right, is going from 7, 5, 3, 9, 4, and then we start with in a cycle. So 7 is a pre-periodic point, and the orbit will be all this continuation. Okay, and then, then, then this is, in general, what we do with this kind of object. Of course, we obtain much more information. We, are, we would like to understand how our cycles and interesting properties, and you will see. Okay, so uh, when I talk about finite arithmetic dynamical systems, we refer uh, I mean, the set in which we are working, in which we are doing dynamic, will be a field or a, a set with an arithmetic interest. So, for instance, finite fields or powers of finite fields or periodic fields, for instance. So, this will be a, an arithmetic dynamical system. So, in the case which we take a finite field, you know that the number of elements is a power of p. And then we have the following nice theorem. It says that every finite arithmetic dynamical system is polynomial, which means that you always will find polynomial functions with coefficient in the field, in the finite field, such that uh, the dynamical system may be realized as polynomials in n variables. Uh, the functions are given by polynomials in a variable. So this is a very nice theorem because once we have polynomials, if you are guys that like algebraic geometry, for instance, you want to do algebraic geometry in this kind of objects, and then you may get more tools to study the dynamical system. Okay. So uh, an interesting thing is that you, you we have an, a bijection of a non-canonical isomorphism between f q to the power n and the final field with q n elements just by choosing a basis. So they are isomorphic as vector spaces over f q, which means that we can extend this theorem to, to final fields or whatever. Also, uh, this fp to the n may be realized as a truncated periodic numbers, right? So just taking periodic numbers must be n and, and doing this, uh, this identification. So to a, to a, a n tuple of elements here, we can send it to this periodic number in which the best are zero if you want, so or this truncate periodic number. So this is interesting. Of course, the image, I mean, we're getting a subset of the periodic numbers, which is finite, okay? Because we have only five. Good. So this is an important thing. And more generally, if I have a field, any field, it may be your complex numbers, whatever, any field, K, and I have a subset of, of this, field which is finite, then if I have a function from A to K, and in fact, a more general statement of this is if I have a function from A to any extension of K. So I have a function from A to K, then there exists a polynomial function, phi with coefficient in my K, such that the, the dynamic, the dynamical system, or such that the phi, uh, leave, or there exists a polynomial function so that uh, this polynomial function leaves F. So in a, in a picture, I know. I have to go here. So this is this is the diagram. So I have my function from a finite set to k. So there is a polynomial function such that if I restrict this to a finite set, yes. But this is a polynomial function, okay? So you get this connected. Let me see what I can connect again. Okay, anyway. So, 
Okay. Um, in particular, if K is a finite field, then every dynamical system is polynomial in this finite field, of course. Okay. So I uh, have our homework for you. So this is a school, right? <laughs> so um, I have these dynamical systems in, I, in F2 to the power 3 and F2 to the power 4, right? And I, I'm just giving you the graph in dynamical systems. So my question is, can you find a polynomial that defines these dynamical systems? It's an interesting and nice work, so just work on it. And it's nice. Okay, there are, we can say more things about the polynomial. For instance, we can bound the, the degrees of the, in each variable of this polynomial, but that's okay. Okay, okay that's it. Good, this is a homework, and just remember, okay? So this is a nice thing to think today while drinking a beer, maybe. Okay, so. So lifting finite dynamical system to the periodic numbers. So this is now um, basically as a corollary of all this, we, we also have this theorem. Every finite arithmetic dynamical system from one of these uh, powers of a, of a periodic field, or, or finite field, sorry, leads to a periodic polynomial discrete dynamical system from QP to QP. So I can lift this to a polynomial. Not uniquely, by the way, but uh, we can lift it. And then what we have is this picture. We have a, when we choose, for instance, that this iota is just the inclusion that I give us truncated numbers, for instance. That means arithmetic in this context? Just it's just that we are using fields which with arithmetic interest and in particular finite field. Okay. Is this a polynomial? Big three is a polynomial. So it's a polynomial discrete dynamical system. Ah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. This is hard to follow diapositives, but this is this is uh well, and then if we for instance we take truncated if we identify this with a truncated periodic number. Then uh, we get a function from a subset of here going this way to these static numbers and using the theorem, then we get a polynomial identity. And then this is very good because once we have polynomial identical system, then we have a topology here, which is not a discrete topology. We have a periodic topology and then study the dynamics of this. May I give you some interesting properties of the path. but. As I told you, once we have polynomials, well, first of all, if we have this field and I have a, an extension of this field, this polynomial has position in, F, in QP, QP is inside CP or any extension of QP, then we can consider the same polynomial given the dynamics, but now in CP in the complex periodic numbers or any finite extension of QP or any extension of QP. And then, uh, since this leaves this, this, this should leave also this, this number. But in fact, this generalize this. So, and then you get also a lifting like that. Why is it better to consider extension? Because we have more tools, so more geometry. You can do geometry in CP. Well, this is the philosophy, right? So if you have more, this is why you consider complex numbers instead of real numbers. You want to solve algebraic equations. Then. If, for instance, you want to study the, the singular point of five or yeah, the, the series of five. So, so you can already do some algebraic geometry. For example, if we consider the series of this polynomial five, so the variety associated, the algebraic set associated to this five, we get the pre-image of zero. So it's like, and then if you choose the polynomial five minus x, minus variable x, is a polynomial that you, you calculate the algebraic variety associated to this, you get the fixed points. And then you do it, the k iteration of this, you get the k is the k periodic points and so on. So you, you can do some things. And then of course, if you are solving polynomials, you would like to have roots of this polynomial. So going to an algebraic closure field or a complete field is useful. But what if, if you are doing some algebraic geometry, you just know that CP is the affine line, right? And this is a, a, a regular function between Algebraic varieties, 
then you can consider projective varieties. And you get projective varieties, but if you continue like that, why not? You can go to more general space, like rigid analytic varieties, for instance. And then if you go, you go to uh, Berkowitz spaces, and if you continue like that, you even go to perfectoid spaces, and you can work with this dynamical system. The problem is that, in principle, we think that it may be easier to, because we have more points, the, right, the reality is we know just a few things about these kind of things, and then this is an active research area of mathematics. So uh, we don't know as many things as in complex numbers. So this is a very active research area in mathematics, and of course, going to work with spaces is a difficult problem, but uh, next week, uh, you are we are going to have a talk Right, talking about dynamics in Berkowitz spaces, so it will be good. So, so just to illustrate how Berkowitz spaces look like, or, or the projective line concretely, these are some pictures of these vector respeed, are like more or less like metrics, but which more, more, much more um, branches. Okay, so, okay. But since I have to say something about biology, I have to pass to the biology of the case. There are other things we can say about this dynamical systems so so in particular i'm going to go to talk about a paper or the results of this paper basically i'm not going into the details but the results of this paper with Juridia cortez and pablo padilla from imagina myself and then we try to stop morphogenesis and morphogenesis thank you the pronunciation morphogenesis is it comes from the greek word morph which means form and genesis, which means creation. So it's the creation of the form. And then we are interested in understanding how life forms. So you know that if we study like plants, we have the meristem. So the meristem is just a bunch of cells. Uh, and this bunch of cells, eventually, when they start to grow, differentiate to the different parts of plants. So the same thing happens with humans or, or animals. We have the, instead of meristem, we call mother cells, I guess. So we have mother cells and, and they start to develop and then eventually they form organs, right? And the human life. But the, the interesting thing of these cells is that if I take one of these cells in, 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 and, and I, um, I have to develop, the organs are, are developing and I take one of these, cells and I put in, the, in that organ, the, these cells develops to the organ in which I put, no? develop and reconstruct. So in fact, you know that there are plenty of animals that, uh, for example, when you cut the tail, they regenerate the tail because they have this capacity of transport uh, mother cells to the place and they start to reproduce once they're in the place they need. So this is there's a very interesting application. So this is what happened. So we wonder why, if we have a bunch of cells in similar conditions, right? If you just look at the cell, you see you don't see difference between one and, and another in the very early stage of development of the of the human. But eventually, they differentiate to the different parts of organs of the thing of the plant of the life. So, so the cellular division happens something like that. We have the, the genetic information inside the cell. So you have replication of the genetic information inside the cell, then the cell divides, and then to get new cells with the same genetic information. However, the new, even if they, these two cells have the same genetic information, the, the genome of the, the, the genes that are, active, that are activated in the cells are different. Also, although they have exactly the same genetic, uh, the same genes, the activation of the genes may be different and the way they process the proteins may be different. And then biologists wonder why, I mean, what is going on? So this is cellular division in passwords. And then all of you may know Alan Turing because this is a famous guy after the film, Hollywood film of, of this cryptography and second world. And then everybody knows him because of that. But you must know that at the end of his life, Alan Turing started to do 
mathematical biology, and exactly he wondered these kind of questions. He was studying morphogenesis, and then he got very interesting results in this. In this uh, so basically, he postulated that there are some uh, uh, molecules called morphogenes that they are the molecules that help the cells or the genes in the cell to differentiate to different parts of the of the and then basically they depend on concentrations and the interaction with this with the cells and the ambient so they postulate this and then later biologists in fact find that in fact there exists something like this idea of Turing something like morphogenesis Okay, so it's a molecule that defeats the govern the pattern of tissues and development. Okay, so basically, so these morphogenes are think or are found to be the, the the ones who activate or deactivate genes, right, in a in a cell, and therefore, they after replication they interact with each other and then generate morph morphogenes, and then we have. Uh, after that, we have a, a, a full interaction between all the genes and the cells that are developing, and then that's why if we uh, if we are um, if, we, if we put a cell a mother cell in, in another organ, they start to develop like that. Yes. It's called stem cell. Stem cells, yes, I guess. So I'm not biologist. I may be saying some a lot of imprecision, so, but yes, okay, I believe you. Okay, so basically this is like that. So um, what I'm telling you. So the last part is that um, we can look the development of uh, life or of a cell, say, and look at the genetic state in certain points. So the cell is moving, if you want to think it continuously, but there are only like um, uh, jumps in the development in which suddenly they change. All right, and there are important changes in the genetic configura configuration of the cell. So, which led us to consider dynamical systems, in particular what biologists and computologists call genetic regulatory networks. So, a genetic regulatory network is a collection of genes that interact each, with each other and with other substances in the cells to control the expression levels and protein synthesis, thus. Uh, determining the body shape, right? So it is a network of interaction and the interaction between these genes determine the shape of them. So in our particular problem, we would like to understand the flower architecture, which means, uh, the question is, well, I mean, the usual architecture of flower is like that. So outside we have sepals. After the sepals, we have petals. Inside, we have stamens. Stamens. And inside, we have carpels. So we have, this is the architecture of the flower. And the question is why we have this architecture. We observe this architecture most, and really most of the flowers step two flowers. One is a Mexican flower, which is called, I don't remember the name, but, this is, um, <laughs> but in which the order is changed. Right? But most of the flowers, like the question is why? Why this? Okay. So there are a lot of ways of to build models, mathematical models, in order to understand this. We we construct a model, of course, using dynamical system, arithmetic dynamical systems, in order to understand why this happens. I must say that the, the first work in this direction maybe was the PhD thesis of Uvidia, in which using classical differential equations and the uh, reaction diffusion equation, they model this and they get the, the they could, uh, they, they obtain the, the accurate architecture of the flower after considering some, this, uh, the reaction diffusion equation. So, which is a very interesting work, but since I, I was very close to Judy, yeah, she's my wife, so. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, and, and, and in that time, I was uh, studying some pedic, I was in getting pedic dynamical systems. These are genes, zero ones, dynamics of the genes. So why not model these with pedic dynamical systems, discrete dynamical systems, see what happens. 
And then uh, we did that. So in fact, we, we have, uh, this is the genetic regulatory tree, or this is kind of a picture of genetic regulatory. Each node is, represents a gene that may be activated or deactivated. So we represent it by C11. And then we have the matrix of the, the correlations between the, the genes, the interaction between the genes and so on. So uh, biologists, so is the, 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 from the Institute of Ecology of UNAM, so Judith was working with these guys, but in the PhD thesis, they observe, this is an observation, a real observation of the flower, that the, inter the interaction of the genes was given in this way. So, so in, in, one state, in one step of the process of development, if, if we look at this gene, which is called full, so the state, the next state of this gene after the, well, I mean the, in the development of the flower will depend only on these two other genes in this way. If, the, if both are inactivate, this gene will be activated. And so, so you see the rules, right? So, and then for every single gene, they, they realize that they have this, this relation. So this is the relation that they observe. So they observe like that. So once you observe like that, you see, you have this. What is this? This is a five dynamical system. So zero ones is a function. It's a function from this. So what we did? So we consider the whole uh, set of, of genes that they observe in the in the plant, and the, uh, we choose an order for the genes for the genes. Say this one, and then these genes may be activated or disactivated, and we wonder. Among all the possibilities that we have of activation, disactivation, what we have? They observe what is happening in the next step, and then we, we have this, then we have the next step after an iteration, so, and then we have the next step and the next step. So we are constructing this uh, finite dynamical system, a finite graph. So if, if I call S1 this vector, then the next step after the iteration with the rules they found give you an S I plus one is the next step. So we construct the graph. So we can get the graph of this. But we know that the rules that they give us are really polynomials. So we can find the polynomials. I did an algorithm, I have the polynomials, so it's very easy. And then we can study everything else. So, so uh, in this case, as I thought, we get a, a, an arithmetic dynamical system coming from this relation given by a polynomial of the, you know, the genetic regulatory tree that they observe. And what we get, uh, we find that gamma is a forest. It's a, so it's a forest that we call the epigenetic forest. So in fact, the epigenetic forest is a little bit more than this. But in general terms, it will be an epigenetic forest. Because this is an epigenetic landscape of Weddington. If you know something differential, classical differential equations, you might recognize this. But then uh, this is a forest which is very important because which means that we only have no, we don't have cycles. We only have uh, fixed points, and the every single fixed point corresponds to the genetic configuration of every organ of the flower. I mean, if you take a flower. If you take the petals and you look at the configuration, the genetic configuration of the, this is a fixed point of the dynamical system, which is very surprising. They found it in a different way already. The, the biology knew already this, but we confirmed somehow this with the dynamical system. So, uh, well, now that we have this uh, in a mathematical point of view, we are interested, of course, if you are a biologist, you are interested in knowing what else you can say about the biology. Field. But if you are a mathematician, maybe you want to study is this a dynamical system like that, you know that we can lift it to the periodic numbers and then study the periodic dynamical system. And then in, you have much more points and you want to understand what is the relation of this dynamical system with the, with the other one. And this is what we do, we do somehow. And then and more, I mean, and more, we, you can go until Berkovich spaces or more, right? So you can try to understand this. So just to show uh, the fixed points, after iterating over polynomials, we find these fixed points. And then these fixed points are exactly the genetic configuration of each, each one of these parts of the flower. So the principal organs of the flower, some other extra uh, organs which correspond to the roots of the flowers and some other parts. And then just to show you the, the graph 
we do the graph. So, for example, this is the tree of sepals. Since um, every tree has only a single fixed point, so every tree corresponds to an organ. So, so this is the sepal tree, this is the petals, this is the stamens, the carpets. We have other nice pictures, nice pictures of these or drawings, but I didn't break it. So if you're interested, you can look at the paper. They are there, of course. And then um, remember that what we want is to, to understand how, this, how the flower develops and they form the organs. So you see that the, in the meristem of, of a plant, all the cells are like around, and there is no distinction between cells at the beginning, just at the beginning, so in the meristem. So we have a radial symmetry. And you see also while the flower is developing, so what is happening? While the flower is, flower is going on and going on is developing, the flower is also for radial symmetry, right? So it's symmetric. So if we make a cut of the flower in any step of the development, understanding, understanding the order in which the flower is formed is, I mean, to understand the order is enough to understand the configuration of, of um, the genes in this cut, right? So we just consider the cut of this. And then at the end, for instance, at the end of the, or near to the end of development, you see that in the, in the outside part, you get sepals. So the, conf the genetic configuration of the cells around the border will be the sepals. This is natural, so this is. So we have a chain. And what the characteristic of the chain in any state, in any state of development is the characteristic as the uh, nearby cells have similar genetic configuration. Seeing they have similar genetic configuration because you are cutting and then in every state they, uh, I mean, at the end, they, they, these two may be sep, uh, sepal, sepal configuration. And then you see that the genetic configuration is the same. But in every state of the development, they will have like similar. And what, what do we mean by similar in a biological sense? Similar genetic configuration means that the number of one and zeros in which once we compare the two vectors of zeros and one, the number of one and zeros are more or less the same. I mean that the Hamming distance, if you know something about, is small. Okay, so this is like the, like the biological issue. Oh, this is getting disconnected. So, okay, so we try to model this situation in the periodic dynamical system. So, or in the finite dynamical system, for instance. So we need some, uh, some uh, definitions. We would like to solve this as an optimization problem. We make the conjecture that the configuration of the flower is, is uh, due to a, an optimal solution of a, of a um, function, I'll say. We can say that it's, that it's of a function. Uh, in terms of these cuts, so if I, I have a, the cut, a possibility of cut, and then if we study this space, then we would like to optimize an energy function or a work energy function of this. And then we define a, a work energy function. So if I have my graph, if I take a point, so we wonder what is the work or the energy that this point or a cell, a cell with this configuration needs or, or, or spend in order to get differentiated. So if this is a, the dynamical system and this is the fixed point, the root of the tree, this is the fixed point, this is the graph. So after the following steps, this, this path, which is the orbit of the point, will arrive to the fixed point, which is the gene of corresponding to the flower, to the organ of the flower. So we wonder what is the work or the energy spent to this. So if we have a genetic configuration, here's one, and then we iterate the dynamical system with this, this. So zeros and ones will change, right? So what was the work in both, in order to pass from this step to this step? We conjecture that this is proportional to the number of genes that changes. This is a natural like uh, assumption. If you're changing one gene, then you have, uh, you spend some work on this, right? You have 10 genes, then you have more work spent. So this was like a natural, 
So we consider the Hamming distance. So we are having the Hamming distance with this. And then if we add, do the addition of all the Hamming distance until the root, we are getting like a measure of a energy of a work spent for a point to do this. So, but we can do it for any chain. If I get a chain of, um, of cell configurations, we can calculate the energy of the chain. Or in fact, if, we, if I take any subset of points, we can calculate the energy of definition, we call it the energy of definition of this set in order to get the final. Then, since I don't have much time, so you see that the energy of a subset or in particular this change is just the sum of the energies of each point. And then uh, at the end, what you are getting is a function from the set to the real numbers with have very nice properties. For example, the energy of every point is bigger or equal than zero. The energy of a point is zero if and only if the point is a fixed point. And then nice properties that make us look this as an integral, right? Or a measure or something like that we can consider as an integral. And uh, that's why we call or we just like to represent symbolically, you not know, like this the, the energy of this C as an integral depending on the Hamming distance. But this is just. And then you see some results like the energy of fixed points of the fixed points is just zero. And then uh, we can consider, sorry, because I put this in Spanish, but <laughs> this is, I just copy paste from another talk. So, uh, um, we can consider the space of all chains in the, in the set, which is, uh, I imagine this like the curves, like, like paths in complex analysis, right? like paths. This is the set of all chains of length k. And uh, this R is about uh, the Hamming. I mean, when you have a line in, in real numbers, you can characterize, characterize the line in real numbers be, be, because if you take an intermediate point, so the distance from the two extreme points is equal to the sum of the distance, right? So we can define also like lines on, in the Hamming world, in the Hamming distance, like. We can also define two lines or two paths in which consecutive consecutive um, dots have some distance two, and then this is the shortest distance. I mean, if I have three points, then the, the distance between these three is not smaller than the sum of the distance. So we have k paths and one paths and so on. So this is the space of this kind of paths of a certain length, and we can associate this functional to this path, functional in this sense. Which is the integral, and then we would like to minimize this is an optimization problem. So we would like to find the optimal chain in which they spend the less energy possible. Since this is a finite finite set, in principle we can do it exhaustively, like just calculate this. But even for finite set, this two to the thirteen elements is a lot of work. But happily, there exist computations and computers, and then. And then not uh, even with for computers the hard work, but uh, we can with pseudo optimal solution using uh, the genetic algorithms or these computation computational tools to to adjust solutions in order to get an, an optimal solution. So we did it. Yuridia did it, and then uh, we get that the optimal path. For a certain length, which also with a biological important uh, meaning, or recovers the optimal path, I mean, the path with less energy recovers the flower architecture. So, if we get the path like that, if we, if we start with sepals, then we pass to petals in this way, they, then to stamens, and then to carpels. And the energy was 36. This is a pseudo optimal solution. So, which means that we may run different different times the algorithm and get different solution in which the energy may change for a little bit, just for a little bit. And then we get these results, which is uh, which means that our conjecture is more or less right. I mean, this is not. So we run different different times, and this is like a picture of another run of this situation that you see. We recover the flower structure of this. And then this is um, uh, just studying the dynamic, the finite dynamical system. But then, um, even if, even in the organs, 
even if this is the same organ, we have more detailed differences, all right? Like why is in the top of the organ and not in? So even if we, if have, if we have a, a sepal, the sepal is not equal in every state, right? Even though, so the conjecture is when we pass to complex to periodic numbers, since this uh, genetic configuration is just like a truncated periodic numbers, the tail of the periodic number may give you more detailed information of what is going on with the dynamics. This is just a conjecture that is good to explore. And then while well, we are working, thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Rafael. Uh, are there any questions? Let me, let me check online again. Uh, okay. One. For the previous slides, you mentioned finite dynamic system for a special kind of forest. Forest structure? Yeah. Yeah, because this is uh, which one? This is a forest structure. This is an epigenetic forest. We call this epigenetic forest. Uh, very. Back? You told me. Oh yeah, and um, and I remember, yeah, this. So I, I, I just wonder, do you have the experience formula for this point? I have it, not in this life. My computer is that ugly? Is it ugly? Well, not that ugly. I mean, workable. What degree of uh, you have a pound for the degrees in each variable. Uh, it's not bigger than 13 in each variable. So, but, but this is an study. This result is well known in that yeah. every every function. Yeah. Of course, this is the nature of the order in the in the genes. They correspond with the with the numbers. That change the polynomial. There is, there is a permutation transformation that gives. Us. That's change the degree. Any what doesn't change the degree? No. no, doesn't change it. Change the name of the variables. So you have a permutation transformation that changes the polynomial. Yes. Hi, sorry. Um I if I'm not mistaken, you mentioned that this was a study based on a specific flower. Well, my question is, are you aware if this phenomenon it happens in another species. Yes, it, it, you you. Can apply it. We, this is like an illustration for this flower, but you can apply it for any genetic regulatory. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so, okay. So, yeah, let's maybe uh, thank you, thank uh, speaker again. Thank you, Rogelio. And uh, so let's, let's call it a day and, uh, and uh, see you tomorrow. We, we restart at the uh, next day. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>